Okay, good evening. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for Tuesday, February 2, 23rd, 2016. We'll start the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. This is the public session portion of the meeting. The board started tonight in executive session where we discussed strategies with respect to collective bargaining updates by town manager relative to fire, and also discussed strategy with respect to deployment of public safety. We'll start the public session off as we always do with a public forum where residents are invited to share ideas, opinions, or ask questions regarding town government. Do we have anyone who'd like to come forward this evening? Please. Um, Pam first. Can I get, I, I'm sorry, sorry, sir, I didn't see you. Can you? <laughs> Can't hear me? No. Pam Waxlax, 15 Smith Road. I'm talk back to talk about the trash and the E.L. Harvey contract and hoping that you will consider moving forward again with the idea of single stream recycling based on both the EPA and Columbia University studies. Um, single stream recycling is has the highest participation rate of any recycling out there. and Given the amount of trash that we throw away, I really think that if we can move to a single stream recycling, we will do better with this. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Uh, Rick Solfaro, 132 Fruit Street, Hopkinton. Um, I would like to present to you the voice of the community through many signatures of many distraught Hopkinton residents. The residents are questioning why this current situation regarding the fire chief has had to come this far. I have been a Hopkinton resident for 67 years and have known and respected all the fire chiefs, starting with Joe Pine, followed by Arthur Stewart, Rick McMillan, Gary Doherty, Kenny Clark, and I have known Steve Slim in most of his life. All of these men were raised in Hopkinton, ex except for Gary Doherty. We have all seen firsthand their hard work and dedication to the fire department to the town of Hopkinton, and have all come up through the ranks in the fire department. Mr. Polanco, you communicated recently in the police department promotions that it was a privilege to see the officers in the department come up through the ranks. Why not the fire department? The citizen, citizens of this community are perplexed at the resistance of the selectmen not willing to listen to the opinion regarding the fire chief. This shows a lack of respect towards the residents in this town trying to provide the best choice for fire chief. Steve Slamman is clearly the best choice for fire chief. He has proven his dedication and qualifications to the community beyond a reasonable doubt. It is time to do the right thing, appoint <clears throat> Steve Slam and his full-time fire chief. I would now like to present to you 18 pages of signatures of distraught citizens of Hopkin and wanting this situation to be resolved and to appoint Steve Slam as our fire chief. If I may. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Don Collins, 45 Teresa Road. I'm also uh, Assistant Fire Chief at Massport Fire Rescue at Logan Airport. Uh, I'd like to thank the Board of Selectmen for the service to the town of Hockenden, as I appreciate the time and efforts dedicated to make Hockenden a better place to live and raise our families. I would also like to thank the Fire Chief Search Committee for their time and efforts in vetting through all the candidates who applied, interviewing those qualified, and forwarding the names of whom they thought would be a good fit for the town. This committee should be lauded for their efforts as the police chief search committee was a year previous. I have traveled all over the country in my 32 years as a firefighter, uh, training, learning, teaching, selling fire equipment, and unfortunately attending funerals. I belong to many fire organizations, both professionally and socially. I have sat on interview panels for promotions and was involved with auditing two textbooks. I have seen many different faces of the fire service, both superior and not so. I've been a teammate, hunting partner, classmate, EMT partner, and a line mate on, on many hose lines with Steve Slamman. I responded to numerous fires, accidents, and any a number of emergencies with favorable outcomes and some not. Steve Slamman, I can assure you, is as solid as they come. He was the initial incident commander, one of the darkest times in Hopkins' recent history, on the early morning hours of July 24, 2002, as two beautiful young sisters were killed in a house explosion. Steve knew immediately that they were too late also realizing that, the call had been, that if the call had been directed to the fire department moments earlier, that he and his crew may have been killed. 
as they would have been walking in the front door as the building came down around them. All this going through his mind in mere seconds as he knew that the, he still had a search and rescue mission to organize, fires to put out, gas to shut off, and initiate calls for extra resources, all before he passed command to the chief upon his arrival. Steve Slammon is an extremely educated self-motivator who has worked hard to be certified as an executive chief fire officer, a title not carried by many. He's humble in the fact of always looking to better himself and his crew, however experienced enough to be able to make a quick life or death decision with total confidence. Steve is a town resident who has made his way up to the ranks with hard work and sacrifice. Steve has also risen through the ranks at basically the same rate as chiefs in most of the surrounding towns to Hockenden and has established great relationships with all of them through the years and he has the respect of all of them. Steve Slammon has worked hard to get where he is today. He is solid, he is humble, and he is the best choice for the job at Hopkins Fire Chief. Let's stop this charade and give Steve the respect that he deserves. Thanks for your time. <clears throat> Anybody else for public forum? <clears throat> Tom McIntyre, 29 Pleasant Street. I'm a member of the Hopkins Fire Department. I've been for 40 years. Uh, I've seen Steve Slamming in action. I can't really add much more than what Don Collins said, but I've seen him in action. He knows his stuff, and there's not a problem with him being chief in this town as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Anybody else for public forum? All right. Thank you all. Next time on the agenda is the consent agenda. It's action items. First one is minutes. The board will consider accepting the following public session minutes of February 2nd, 2016. The second is a bond authorization note, an action item. Pursuant to various articles of the 2050 X uh, annual town meetings, the board will consider approving a bond authorization note in the amount of $9 million of various capital projects approved to respective town meetings. Third is a marathon fund request. The board will consider approving a marathon fund request for $1,750 for the purpose of transferring 16 Hopkinton High School football films from 1930 through 1982 from 8mm or 60mm films to QuickTime Files. These will be shown at various times as part of Hop TV's From the Vault programming. And the fourth is board appointments. An actual item, the board will consider appointing candidates to the Upper Trails, Trails Committee and the Marathon Committee. The Metro West 45 partnership is listed, but that is actually not an appointment from the Board of Selectmen. Uh, would anyone like to break out any of the items on the consent agenda? Okay. Number three, please. Number three, which is the marathon fund request. I guess we should probably break up board appointments, too. Um, do we have the appointees here? Huh? Yeah, that's what I was going to yeah. say. Okay. So we'll chair on a motion to approve uh, items one and two on the consent agenda. So moved. Second. second. Motion second for discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, present, not voting. That's unanimous. Item three, marathon fund request. Mr. Sestari. Um, I'm just, I'd love to see this happen. Um, I'm just trying to remember exactly what the, uh, I guess, charter of the marathon fund monies is supposed to be directed at and whether this is something that's better for, um, uh, um, losing <coughs> track of which other fund, but um, CPA? CPA, CPC. thank you very much. CPC? Oh, yeah, okay. CPC, CPA. Um, so I'm just uh, wondering exactly what the, what the charge is and make sure that it fits under that. Marathon fund people aren't here tonight, right? Ms. Kamala, can you take that? Yes, through the chair. The charge is very general. It supports activities that are related to um, sport activities by uh, youth in the community. Youth in the community, correct? Yeah. yeah. There's the answer. Okay. Um, you know, again, I'd like to see this happen, but I'm not sure that this really uh, supports the activities of youth in the community. Okay. Mr. Uh, Chair. Yes, sir. So, uh, not to pile on, uh, over the years I've been very supportive of the Marathon Fund and the requests for the, from the Marathon Fund. This one caught me by surprise for that reason that Mr. Sestari, I think, is bringing up. I'm not opposed to it, but I'd be interested in hearing more before I'd vote for it from the committee itself. Um, yet, you know, we, we talk about youth, yet uh, I, I work over Golden Pond, and there are, there are many Hopkinson residents that live there. 
and uh, there are a couple of them that are always talking about their football careers at Hopkins and High School. Um, you know, uh, and um, you know, this might be one of those things that they would just love to see. So, it, you know, I, I still think because they live, they they relive their their youth uh, a lot. And well, I don't think anyone's questioning the merits, Mr. Kinnear. I think the question is the funding source. Where should the money come from? Yeah. I'd vote for it either way, but I want to understand right. why it's coming from this fund and not. CPC. Yeah. All right. Why don't we take no action this time, Ms. Kamal? Can we can we think about this more deeply and maybe have the marathon fund folks? Come I think in? it could start a trend that we got to be careful. Yeah. With. Okay. Can we just can we rethink this? Okay. All right. We'll take that up next time. And then board appointments. Uh, I just want to break this out because I, in case some of the folks are here. So the Upper Charles Trail Committee. Um, we have one applicant to go from an alternate voter member to an to a full member, and that's because of a opening, Mr. Kamalo, on the committee. So is there any chance Dave O'Brien's in the room? Okay. So again, this one's fairly perfunctory. Um, uh, and then the second one is for a, um, a relative newcomer to town here, Mr. Chuck Wallace, who's looking to uh, join the marathon committee, um, mm. which apparently has an outstanding chair from what I know right of her. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, I don't know if anyone wants to, in, to discuss any of those or... Otherwise, the chair will entertain a motion to approve both those appointments. So moved. Second. So for all three. We're, the 495 partnership isn't one of our appointments. We don't make that. Good. So it's, uh, then the motion would be to approve um, Dave O'Brien to the Upper Ch Charles Trail Committee and Chuck Wallace to the Marathon Committee. I think we had a motion and I'll second. I have a motion and a second already. Good. Just clarifying. Just clarifying for you what yeah, it was. Okay. All right. Motion second. Further discussion. Everyone's all set. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. President not voting. That's unanimous. Welcome, Chuck, to the Marathon Committee. Thank you very much. <laughs> I thought he was already on it, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, now off to the highlight of this evening's uh, events, 300th Anniversary Celebration Committee, sealing of the time capsule. Gene Birchman, the chair of the now legendary 300th Anniversary Celebration Committee, <laughs> will close and put a final seal on one of the boxes for the time capsule and will affix a plaque to the bench. Right. Ms. Birchman. Thank you. Like a bad penny, we keep turning up. Um, so I'm joined by Mike Whalen and John Foster, who I know are familiar to you. Who um, <clears throat> John is the artisan who crafted this incredible bench, and Mike is uh, <laughs> the brave soul who dug the old time capsules out of the 2,000-pound um, granite stone at the Korean church. So. Today, I asked him if he would seal the new time capsules, and he didn't even have to remove his tie. So I think this was an easier, easier task today, but I wanted to give him the honor of doing that since he did the heavy lifting for us the last time. So the time capsules, there are three. There are two to be opened in 2065, so 50 years, and one to be opened in 100 years in 2115. The big one um, for 2000, and I sent you all a list of the contents. Um, the big one has all manner of documentation from the year and then there's another one that has letters primarily from kids in town to themselves 50 years in the future so um I, Tommy, I, you're getting right to it you can't be you're not, he's getting, <laughs> he, yeah he's not fooling around um i, I also want to thank chris alicandro who was on our committee and he uh, helped yeah, us Can we show it to the crowd? Is there any chance we can lift it out, or is it already kind of in? There is no chance. It's in. Never mind. Yeah, Disregard. We can't, this is the one flo Another we can't dumb idea get our fingers right. around right. it to pull it back out, so that's a problem for somebody 50 years in the future. Um, but I will say, John, Puzzle. so John is sealing it now with tamper-proof screws yeah. with a special bit on his drill, and if the people in the future do not have that, he has cleverly concealed one right there in the um, bottom of the bench for them. So... Uh, he's made it as easy as he possibly can for them to retrieve it. Um, there's a, uh, a International Society for Time Capsules, believe it or not, that registers time capsules. So I will register all three of these. Um, they estimate that 9,000 of the 10,000 time capsules in existence have been lost. So we're doing everything we can to hide this in plain view in the library and register it and put as many pointers as we can to it and, you know, 
control whatever variables we can to make sure that people at the next celebration will find it and enjoy revealing it the way that we did when we, uh, when we dug the old ones out of the Korean church. So thank you for your participation. Oh, wrong, this yeah. has been a really fun project. Mr. Chair, so Sir. is the bench going to reside in the library? Yeah, it's going to sit here for the next year until the new building is done, and then it'll be moved over to some secure location in the library, you know, inside the main doors. Excellent. Along with that, that quilt thing is going to go over there, too. That's really nice. Yeah. Actually, Where did that come from? Gene, Can we talk about that? Yeah, talk, uh, talk about the new prop here. The, um, so that will also go in the library. John, your drill bit's still in there. He's got it. Oh. Um, that will go. That was a fundraiser for the library renovation project. It was worked on by a lot of um, of quilters in the town. And Susan Marshall really did a tremendous amount to solicit donations and sell the book spines. There are some notable authors on there. Um, Laura Hillenbrand, the author of Unbroken, signed a spine. Geraldine Brooks, so a lot of really <coughs> internationally known authors signed it, as well as a lot of people in town donating money. The middle shelf uh, represents all of the founding fathers that donated the original money to get the library built in the yeah, first it's place. It's very symbolic. So it's, um, it's, cool. it's sort of to honor them. So yeah, so hopefully these two things will stay together in the library and be enjoyed um, by everybody. It's very nice. Excellent. So I think John and Mike can tip the bench back up for you and, and place it here. I, I will come back tomorrow and put the rest of these screws in. Yeah, I was okay. wondering about so if anyone wants to break in this, you break in tonight. <laughs> so it is a little bit heavier now. <laughs> and you'll see when they turn it over, you'll see there's also a plaque in the front that really says, like, yeah. right here, this is where they are. So hopefully people will find them. I'll them a giant billboard. And open them up. Excellent. Yeah. So we'll just put it in front here for the yeah. Well, you guys should get a picture with it one last time. All right. All right. Very nice. Great job. Thank you. Gene, you want one final picture with your, with your crew here in front of it? Sit, sit on it. Relax. You guys should sit on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> take, take a load off. Sit on the bench. In fact, Cross your legs. Reading. Stay the master meeting there. You guys can. can I'll get out of the way. Yeah, I'll get out of the way. Uh, mm -hmm. Trust me, no one wants me. Photo bombing. <laughs> All right, smile. Okay. I'm All right. Well done. Thank you. Nice bench. And I do want to make one final comment on Mike, the Alpha and the Omega here, who got the, other one, got the old ones out. Gene, all the old ones went back in there too, right? You didn't mention that part, but no, the old ones didn't go back in there. Never mind, disregard. Okay, so fine. Mm -hmm. Old ones are saved for posterity. Fix me in else. the old I'm going to put them back in the cornerstone. <laughs> and yeah. Hey, Mike, you've got to tip the stone over and put the old one back now. In Norman's office. <laughs> you had fun doing that one. <laughs> you had fun. I did have fun. Uh, all right. Moving right along, the BA Boston Marathon Parade Permit's an action item. I want to start by saying this is not the big event tonight when they all come in and everything. We're, this is just a perfunctory get the parade permit done, so you all can save your, your commentary. Yes, exactly. So the board consider the following parade permits for the Boston 2016. Look, we're going to have a look at you when I say that. 2016 Boston Marathon. For parts of the BAA, it's a training run. Starts at Main Street Hopkinton, ends at, in Boston, Mass. Date and time, March 26, 2016, 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. Street closings are in an attachment, and there's uh, applications and permitting team comments, um, none of which I think are, are, um, are, are anything at all, actually. And then the second one is uh, another run by the, proposed by the BAA. It starts on Main Street, ends in Boston, Mass. Date and time, April 18th, 2016. That might be a little larger crowd for it. And... Um, and again, they seek the permit here, but they'll come in at a later date to have the full-blown discussion about all the activities that go around it. Unless, Dottie, you, do you have anything you want to say tonight, or are you good? Save it for later? Okay, good. Right on. Well, you've got a hard-working new volunteer, I understand, so you should be able to dump the load on somebody there. Um, okay. Anybody in the chair have any comments, questions, sir? Quick question. Did we change the size of the field this year? Is it still 36, I believe? 
30,000. Coming back to 30 this year. Okay, yeah. thank you. Any questions? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't see it. No, it's Come okay. On. I can go over the, uh, the timeline and just kind of go over to review it. That sure. uh, certainly welcome the opportunity it's an easy to sell, say so a couple just, words. Yeah, oh, great. It's an easy. <laughs> but let me just go over the timeline real quick, if we may. Um, for the actual marathon itself, at 6 a.m., we plan on having the uh, military marchers. Uh, that'll be no more than 100 National Guard soldiers that'll march down the course. No rucksacks allowed. It'll just be with maybe a water bottle in their possession, and they'll be in their uniforms. Um, at uh, 8.50, we'll have the mobility impaired. <coughs> Push rims at 9.17 for the men's division. At 9.19, the uh, women's division. Hand cycles will go at 9.22. The elite women at 9.32. Uh, and then 10 a.m. is the wave one and the elite men, and then 25 minutes later for four waves will be waves two, three, and four. So wave four will go off at 11.15. We expect the last runner across the starting line around 11.28 in the morning, uh, and then uh, cross over the Hopkinton Ashland Town line at around 11.55 a.m., and we expect to have the roads reopen around 1.30 at the latest. So that's the general synopsis. Again, 30. the course and uh, we request the permission to keep all the roads accessible the way we've had in the past uh, also using uh, what was formerly Colella's parking lot which will be CVS we've been in conversations with cross point associates for use of Porta Johns athletes village will remain the same the club bus program will remain the same so in all intents and purposes we have the same footprint as we've had the last uh, year now so nothing more to add uh, except for the training run that you mentioned is going to be on March 26th. We do have uh, quite a few runners that will be uh, coming into Hopkinton for that. Again, brought in by buses, uh, primarily a drop-off uh, in the Hopkinton Common area. And then they'll proceed anywhere from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. down the course. Um, we've had a couple of people approach us about uh, possibly having drop-offs at the Hopkinton High School. We're trying to discourage that just because of the, the school committee, and we don't want to create any you know, burden onto the school properties or anything like that. So uh, we've asked for the road closures and the support of the Hopkinton Police Department, which uh, they've responded to really well. We'll have port john facilities, and we'll have presence out here from the BA on March 26th. Thank you. So. Chief, just to confirm you're good with all this? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. That's fine. Uh, Mr. Any more questions or comments? Mr. Mosier. No questions. <laughs> no questions. I think we're good. Chair, I'll entertain a motion to approve the uh, two requested parade permits. So moved. Second. Uh, for the discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, present, not voting. That's unanimous. Great. Looking forward to it. Thank, Thank you very, you very much, much for coming in tonight. Thanks. Daddy, we'll see you again in whatever month or so. Thanks. And six in the agenda, police chief, interim fiscal year 2016 goals review. It's a discussion. The police chief will provide an update on his fiscal year 2016 goals and departmental activities. Chief, welcome. Nice to see you. Good to see you, Mr. Chair. So thanks for coming in. So again, I think this is just a, I haven't seen you in a while in a formal fashion, I guess, at least here. So come on in, tell us what's going on, how's your goals coming, and then just generally, could you just talk about the department, how, you know, how you feel about things, just, just kind of give us a vibe. I feel like I can go over the goals real quickly and yes, uh, where I am at them at this point. Uh, accreditation is for us, and I'm just going to give you a sample policy Thanks, to look at any convenience. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, the first goal was to continue the accreditation process and move into the uh, second phase. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that we have certainly uh, done that. Uh, the big thing that uh, the board was requiring was to get implement uh, the top 12 high-risk policies, mm -hmm. the so-called uh, Dirty Dozen. Uh, the committee has been able to, uh, to, uh, to, to work and mo get some model policies with the uh, federal standards uh, for use of force, domestic violence, response to calls, authorized weapons, handling of juveniles, uniformed appearance rules and regulations, uh, property and evidence, handling mentally ill, pursuit, cruiser video, internal affairs. The one you have there is the uh, sexual harassment policy, uh, citizens' complaints, police media. Uh, one of the uh, 
things that I put down was a seek input and feedback from uh, MASCOP members, and that's all. I also included members from uh, dispatch. Uh, we're in the process of every week yeah, looking at each policy and uh, deciding uh, if there needs any adjustments or uh, anything we can build upon and, and move forward. So that's uh, smooth sailing at this point. <laughs> Uh, second goal. So, Chief, just to summarize the so the policies you just make you moving along. You basically get these drafts in place, and you absolutely just sort of we'll have them in so. by uh, July, and hopefully to have more okay. than just the uh, the thirteenth as the process. Now that we have a, a certain patent that we're doing, uh -huh. we're, we're creating the policies, <laughs> reviewing them. And then uh, we're in the process of implementing and training. And, and, that's and you told at. us before, but can you remind me how many are there total? Uh, there's, there's about 270 different standards. So it's sometimes uh, you when can have different. 23 so. years away from being done with this. Okay, <laughs> get it done quick. These are there's a lot that that are, that are very simple and easy to maintain that we probably already have, and we're just going to review and update. Got it. Okay. Just, yes, sir. If I may, um, through the chair, chief. With regard to any policies that relate to the dispatch or combined communication center, could you please make sure you uh, collaborate with the fire chief as well as town hall? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, the sept sept head officer, crime prevention through environmental design, uh, created a position on the police department. Uh, we chose uh, Arthur Schofield, a uh, young, very energetic officer who has also joined the crime prevention team with Officer Buckley. He's done an outstanding job. As we speak now, uh, he's in a week-long uh, SEPTED school, the basic SEPTED. It's a 40-hour school, introduction to SEPTED, strategies, concepts, human behavior, barriers, lighting, planning. But it's a whole, the, the whole gamut of uh, the basic of SEPTED. And uh, once he comes out of that, he'll be a certified SEPTED officer. Uh, from there, uh, we will work with the town manager in planning to have sept head officer part of the planning team. So that's the next step when he, he, when he completes the, uh, the training. And the, uh, of course, the other element would be uh, getting him involved in doing, uh, we do security audits now. Right now it's basically people go on vacation. We offer uh, uh, house checks, spot checks. And we do quite, a, quite a, a few, especially during the summertime. But this uh, SEPTED officer will be involved in an actual uh, um, a security audit if people have questions and problems or things or something we might be able to touch upon and uh, let them know where they can improve on their security. So that's moving ahead, and that certainly should be done by July. Uh, create a communication plan for the department. Uh, enhance current communication with the governing board and partners in the community. I think uh, the chair and I have uh, certainly worked on, along with the rest of the board on the uh, best way of communicating with the board via text, uh, emails, and of course phone calls if uh, needed. And I think uh, that's been pretty smooth as of late. I know there's been problems in the past with that, but I think we're, we're moving ahead on that. Uh, creative uh, essence of transparency by providing the public with performance measures and other uh, pertinent information. Right now in the process of working with Worcester State and their interns to have them develop a, uh, a better website that's kind of two-way, providing forms for the public, as well as uh, us releasing uh, performance measures and letting people know exactly what we do, how we do it, and uh, quantifying what we do. Uh, build on a relationship with the uh, local media. We certainly use the local media to get the message out. And uh, uh, our public information officer, Joe Bennett, Lieutenant Bennett, certainly has a great working relationship. He just went to some recent training on dealing with the media and uh, garnering a, a good relationship with them. Um, just a few of the community outreach things that we have uh, done in this area just uh, since July is uh, social media. We certainly build upon that, and that begins to flourish. Our uh, public service announcement, which was done uh, by Officer John Corridan to reach out to people uh, with uh, uh, letting them know about the Good Samaritan Law, which involves uh, opiates, to, to certainly uh, don't hesitate and call. Uh, you, know, you, know, you won't be arrested if you do report that someone is having an overdose. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had an Arcan save uh, the other night uh, because someone made that phone call. 
Um, we've had uh, Facebook likes are up 15%, Twitter is up 13%. Uh, detectives are engaged uh, with merchants uh, doing uh, secrets. banks and <laughs> alcohol vendor compliance checks. Our home, uh, I already mentioned home inspe inspections. Um, Officer Buckley and Schofield have lectured on fraud and scams at the Senior Center. Uh, we have created a safe exchange zone at the police department, and people are using it. It's like UPS out there for uh, <laughs> training packages, but it, it's certainly a good, good idea, and I certainly got a lot of feedback from the public that people can go in a safe place if they order something on the Internet. They're not sure who they're dealing with. They meet in a police parking lot, or obviously we're open 24-7, or in the lobby if they choose if they feel safer and uh, able to make their transaction. National Night Out continues to grow. Uh, our involvement with the uh, uh, Hopkinton uh, Prevention Coalition has certainly moved forward. We've taken part in the, uh, uh, showing the movie uh, Anonymous uh, People, um, had a community meeting, family perspective on addiction and recovery. We now have a, a needle drop box in the uh, station, uh, a kiosk, and we'll be attending a lecture by Chris Herring a former NBA basketball star who as he came to uh, addiction was able to be, become clean. Uh, we have the drug tag, uh, uh, drug take back day. Officer Buckley uh, performed at the senior center. Um, we continue to install car seats and uh, we were able to obtain a grant for $2,000 worth of uh, car seats. Uh, we have hosted the rape aggression training class. Uh, that actually wrapped up last night. And we had 24 participants, 20 more, uh, 24 female participants, uh, over a uh, six six class period, and it was very successful. A lot of good feedback on that. Uh, we started a partnership, uh, the Hopkinton Autism and Special Needs Parent Connection. And we continue to look forward hosting another entertainment and educational day. We had a National uh, Autism Day at the police department with tours of the police station. And we were also training one dispatcher and one officer to uh, the outreach program, protecting missing children with special needs. Uh, we continued to work with the jail diversion program. We have a uh, mental health uh, clinician at our disposal and also works one week on patrol with the officers. And the benefits of that have been uh, great. Um, I have to stay up here all, all night. But uh, there's many more things going on in the police department. Obviously, the recruitment drive. Uh, we've uh, hired uh, two offices, and we're, we're looking to have two or more offices in front of the board at our next session. Um, we uh, promoted the two lieutenants that you're all aware of, uh, added an extra detective uh, uh, to the ranks, not to the department, but uh, moved some people around. and. Uh, uh, did a lot of work with the uh, earlier in the year with the 300th with the security and uh, we were able to get dispatch consolidated dispatch up and running for a trial run uh, during that that process so it's been a busy uh, six months and we hopefully uh, we'll continue upon that any big problems we should be aware of anything you're really concerned about any <clears throat> No, uh, things are going pretty smooth okay yeah. Knock on wood. <laughs> okay, okay. Question, Mr. Sestari, any question? Oh, took my question. <laughs> Chief. Um, we lost Chuck, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Chief, uh, you know, you, you keep bringing folks through here from the department. It's great to have the visibility, um, you know, down to uh, the, the individual contributor level. Over the last year, year plus, we've seen so many uh, in, incredible young men and women coming through here, whether there is new officers or people being promoted or just people explaining new programs to us. And their qualifications and achievements uh, never cease to amaze me. And, uh, you know, it's, it's clear that you've got an incredible group to work with, uh, but it's also clear to me that uh, they have a strong leader uh, that's, that's in front of them. And, um, you know, I think that, I think that a lot of the initiatives you've been taking on have been, you know, fantastic. We've always been proud of our police force. We continue to be. Um, uh, this this 15 percent on the Facebook likes. Um, is that year over year, or is that uh, quarter over quarter? Can you get it to 20? <laughs> yeah, we'll certainly try. <laughs> A big hit was uh, uh, Shiloh the dog. 
So <laughs> that, that ended up getting rescued. It was like 25,000 hits on that. Oh, yeah. yeah as compared to 5,000. No, Chief, <laughs> you know, kidding aside, though, um, you know, you seem to be doing a, a fantastic job. I know that uh, the communication, I've felt that the communication between you and the board has been, uh, you know, it's been great. Uh, you know, we're, we're not getting too much, I feel, as though I'm getting enough. Um, and just uh, I'm incredibly proud of, of how this force is uh, acting and reacting to, to things that happen in the public. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Catino. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I'm just uh, so pleased and amazed that every month there seems to be a new initiative. And now that I'm working, I'm working more in town at, uh, up at uh, Golden Pond, you know, I, I, I see all the officers come through, and both police and fire, and the professionalism is just outstanding. And, you know, and, the, and the new program that you just started for us to, to um, document uh, many of the residents that, that um, uh, could be flight risks and, yeah. and, and such, it's just a, a, another great program. You know, we've just gotten spoiled with such a, with such a wonderful uh, force, and uh, with this list of... Uh, of uh, accomplishments and, and uh, things that you're going to do going forward. I, I think we're going to continue to be impressed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Mosier. Chief, you named off a bunch of activities the department's taking part in. Are those things the department's done all along and you're just kind of consolidating this and giving us an overview? Are there new things that you're doing? Are, there, are you coming up with these things? Are they being facilitated by members of the department? We certainly work as a team down at HBD, and I certainly would, you know, I, I've certainly taken what I've learned through my career, but it's a team effort that we come together, we work together as a team to collaborate on ideas which is best for the community. And I certainly have to give most of the credit to the, the men and uh, women of the Hopkins and Police Department who do a, just an outstanding job. But HPD, looking at the history, has always had a uh, been active in the community. Obviously, surveys before I came in with the community have certainly done. Uh, uh, citizens have been quite satisfied with the amount of uh, things we provide for them. And uh, that, that's what we'll continue to do. A lot of these are new ideas, and uh, the, most of them that I read tonight are new ideas, but there's a lot of things that have always always been there. But the, most of them are new initiatives that we're working on. Just one more quick question. I know heroin is prevalent in many communities. Are we holding our own? Are we seeing an increase, decrease? We don't want to fall behind in heroin. No. Yeah. <laughs> we, we certainly, uh, uh, you know, I have two detectives now. I have one assisting uh, in, in the battle with this, with, with this, with this heroin problem with other uh, communities. And it's uh, certainly, I wouldn't say it's... Uh, you know, more prominent here than anywhere else. Obviously, the big cities, the metropolitan areas. But you're not we, seeing like a big increase here locally, or something that we should be immediately concerned well, about. Well, I think everywhere you're seeing an increase where you haven't seen as many uh, attempted. Uh, 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 just this year alone, we've had three knock-in saves. I brought wow. knock-in uh, to the uh, police department oh, over a year period. I mean, nonetheless. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, where we've obviously never had that before because we never had uh, the uh, the knock in as far as on the police side, and um, so yeah, I think you're seeing a, a little bit of a, an increase, but you're seeing it everywhere. Thank you, Mr. Harr. I think the communications are going great. I appreciate that very much, um, and I'm not asking it for any other reason. But I'm curious how how would you define and describe the morale in the in the department today? Well, I think I have a pretty good pulse of what's going on down there, and I, it seems positive. I'm greeted every day with smiles in the morning, and I don't see when uh, people are leaving at the end of the shift. It's not like they're running out the door. When when you see that, people headed to the parking lot, like it's a, uh, the start of the Boston Marathon, it's usually a bad reflection on your leadership style. <laughs> so I think it's been good. I've gotten certainly a lot of uh, good feedback uh, from uh, many officers on the uh, – Police department, and as well as the uh, the dispatches, and I think uh, you know, without tooting my own horn, I think I think morale is at a pretty high spot. That time off. That's my sense as well. That I think that the the, the morale is pretty good, uh, and it's an important piece of the puzzle that you want to watch and, and certainly nurture. But I think uh, all in all, I think it's going very well. Thank, Thank you. you.
Chief, thank you very much for coming in tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, item seven on the agenda, IT director update discussion. Josh Grossetti, the IT director for the town of Hopkinton, will present an assessment of the town's IT program to the Board of Selectmen, and it includes an, a memo. Uh, Good evening. Uh, so for those of you watching at home and the folks here, I realize that I'm likely a new face to many of you. Uh, my name is Joshua Grossetti, the new IT director for the town. Uh, and I've been in this position for about three months now, and I'm here tonight um, to give you a report on my initial assessment of the town's IT department. I'd like to start off by thanking uh, Chris McClure, the previous IT director for the town, and Ashok Ghosh, the IT director for Hopkinton Public Schools, for providing the modern infrastructure that's in place today. The network servers, storage systems um, that are in place right now are extensible and able to handle current foreseeable future computing demands. I don't see these infrastructure systems as limiting us in any way at all. As is true in many technology environments, however, we do have a small number of legacy hardware and software subsystems. These systems should be migrated to more contemporary systems to ensure resiliency, and arguably more importantly, ensure the town is able to obtain proper support from vendors should there be an issue. It's important that these upgrades and changes are done thoughtfully, systematically, and proactively so we're not forced into making decisions if we experience an unforeseen issue. It's also important to note that these subsystems represent a very small minority of the town's overall systems. Um, again, as a newcomer to the IT environment here, I'm very pleased with the environment that I've inherited. The town has leveraged cloud-based systems where appropriate namely our office productivity apps, including email, calendaring, and contacts, as well as our document management system and finance and accounting system are all running in the cloud. We've moved to the cloud and are using software as a service platforms in cases where there's a standard commercial software package or offering that meets the town's needs. Uh, these are not one-off custom apps that are running in a, an Amazon, AWS, or Microsoft Azure type of platform. So in this way, we're on the same platforms and using the same systems as many other businesses, uh, which helps to ensure that we have product support should we need it. We should continue to leverage this type of outsourcing whenever possible, as it will enable us to keep a small internal server and infrastructure footprint, thereby eliminating complexity and helping to reduce operational and upgrade costs. The vision that I have for the town of Hopkinton is that we continue to build upon the great foundation that's already been established, shifting our efforts away from infrastructure and instead refocusing on the process, how we go about our day to day. When we spend less time on care and feeding, we're able to spend more time creating, improving, and thinking outside the box, testing what we believe to be true in terms of how we must accomplish our tasks. Internally for town employees, this means ensuring that we're leveraging technology to best streamline processes and realize the most effective methods of completing our work. How can we migrate more processes away from paper forms and physical filing to systems that are natively and only digital? <clears throat> Externally, for our residents, this means ensuring that we're delivering the best possible experience for them. We should be looking for opportunities to implement more automation of tasks and ways to process and present our residents with the most accurate and relevant information they need in the most expeditious manner. Ease of use and simplicity are paramount. One of the first things I begin to look at is a redesign of the town's website. This is likely the method from which the majority of our residents interact with the town. We average over 400 unique visitors every single day. My vision is that Hopkinton becomes the gold standard in terms of what technology can do for a town. If we're doing this right, this process is never done. We should strive to be the benchmark by which all other towns compare themselves to. Any questions I can answer? Thank you. Excellent. Mr. Kamal, do you have anything to start off with? No questions so far. You're, you're good. Okay. <laughs> you know, I went to Mrs. Sestari first last time. Since you're the resident IT specialist, I will start with you again. 
Josh, how are you doing? Good. It's good. Only been three months. It's only been three months. Wow. It seems longer. <laughs> I hope that's a good thing. <laughs> Thank you. How have you been enjoying the position? Is it what you expected? Are there any kind of surprises, I guess? No, I think um, no, no big surprises. Um, it's, it's what I expected. It's what uh, Norman explained it to be. Um, very happy. Great, great. Um, I want to thank you for the assessment of, of this. I know that uh, in the past we had Chris come and explain what he was proposing the infrastructure as, and uh, I you know, absolutely trust Chris, but uh, sometimes he also would, would speak up here, and uh, you know, I'm listening down here. But um, it's, I think it seems to be all good news as far as the infrastructure goes. Um, you know, I like your approach as far as uh, you know, starting at the front end, going as far downstream as you can. And, really trying to make it a better experience for uh, folks in town who are coming and accessing the system. Um, 400 unique uh, hits a day, unique, uh, unique visitors. visitors. That's, yes. that's a lot for a small town like this, I would say. It, it is. Um, so uh, you know, I think that uh, it seems like we, we have some foundation of information that's out there that, that people like. And uh, you know, certainly, I think that we need to go and fix and improve. And uh, you know, I like what you said about the current system. I'd love to see, I'd love to see us not end up really challenging the extensibility of, of our internal systems. And, uh, and I think that uh, as we move on, hopefully, the cloud will also progress with the applications that, that have become more standards, like, like you were saying. We don't need to be groundbreakers, but be nice to start pushing some of the expense, uh, well, get rid of some of the expense and uh, pushing some of it out there. So, Agreed. it sounds great and uh, nice to be Thank you. Mr. Uh, Moser. Oh, thank you for the, the overview. Uh, it sounds more like kind of refining versus big radical changes and taking a temperature of the environment here to see how you can evolve that and work full processes. Um, so it all sounds good. Um, like Mr. Sestari, I was kind of like, wow, 400 unique visitors a day. So that's, so that's another town hall. That's, that's really important. And I think our website is in uh, dire need of updating. Um, we should make sure it's friendly for all age groups also in, in different uh, levels of uh, skill and comfort with IT because that is, it's our virtual town hall. Um, so I'm glad to hear that you're working on it and um, can't wait to see it. Mr. Herr. I know we talked before um, you were appointed, and I'm trying to remember if you had been in the public sector or private sector or a combination of the two. Private, um, private sector, but prior to this, I was uh, in a nonprofit environment. Okay, okay. I love the ideas of trying to get as digital as we can. I think it's a, that's the job. I mean, it's kind of your world, right? Uh, there is some stuff that will require a hard paper world because it's the public process and sometimes the public process can be a little bit archaic. Um, but I think you're off to a great start and I appreciate uh, all your energy and effort. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Mr. Catino. Yeah, I, I really know the town website needs to get fixed because I noticed today that I wasn't listed. <laughs> That was the only slide. It's been only since slide. resolved. No, no, that's not true. <laughs> but, but who's <laughs> checking that? <laughs> you know, say this profile picture wasn't exactly the yeah, no, <laughs> picture was there. But I had one person in town checking that. You fixed it? I He's there because I saw you today. Okay. I saw you. <laughs> no, no, you'll I was, see. I was staring at you. Bo's just cut in half and I'm not there. <laughs> no, man, you're on it. You're no, back up. I'm back up? Okay. What is this? Thank you. I know where you got the mustache from, but you're back up. <laughs> you're drawing on. Now, on a serious note, um, yeah, if, if at some point you can give us an update on the uh, collaboration that we, that town meeting last year, we spent, spent uh, several hundred thousand dollars on um, security and cameras and, uh, and That's the schools. But, well, it was schools and, and then uh, uh, stuff also had to go down to the uh, police station. We also did some expansion there. I just wanted to make sure that everything was coordinated. 
because we did it um, without it without it, anybody on the town side of with, with IT. We used the the school's IT person, but um, you know we just didn't have anybody on the top. The um, superintendent of school said she was going to overlook it, but it's something I I thought that we really needed to have a, a true IT person. And if at some point you could just take a look at it and and come back to us and see if the Money is, um, was spent or is being spent uh, effectively. Sure. Next, sense. I'm good. Did you have a follow up? Yeah, I do. Actually, um, uh, kind of along those lines, but wondering, have you noticed, uh, first of all, how well how well do the school systems and town systems uh, interface? Do they interface at all? Uh, um, <clears throat> we we shared we share platforms more so than uh, I would say systems interface. So. Um, the, the town and the schools have done a, a really good job of leveraging economies of scale when it comes to our virtualization environment, our storage environment, and our, our core network and switching environment, um, having consolidated all of that under, under one roof. Um, so from that angle, I think it's um, as efficient as, as we could be. Um, in terms of operational systems, uh, where there is overlap, I mean, we do collaborate. But I think by, by the nature of, of the t running a town and uh, running a school system, there's a, a lot of systems that are going to differ. Um, so in those instances, we're, we're not able to. Okay. Yes. If I, Mr. Kamal, yes. If I may, on, <coughs> on, on that topic, I think a couple of points. Um, one, owing to the transition on the town side, I, I think the pace of the uh, um, our efforts towards working with the schools on joint projects is, is somewhat slowed down. Um, secondly, I'm also realizing that uh, perhaps we've gone as far as this joint relationship could take us. So going forward, um, perhaps most of the collaboration is going to be purely opportunistic. <clears throat> so, so is there at least an effort I guess it, it sounds like it sounds like from more of a hardware standpoint, uh, we're collaborating with the schools to find efficiencies. Um, I'm wondering, in the rest of the technology stack, more on the software side, are we trying to, you know, somewhat come together and standardize uh, how how we move forward? Because um, it'd be great if, as we go down the line, we can uh, we can find efficiencies and the resources who are, who are uh, you know, being, being animals, right? Um, so I'm just wondering, are, are we close to that? Are we thinking of that? Um, I, I'd say we're certainly thinking about it. Um, you know, again, in the, in the short time I've, I've been here, um, I have had a number of, of conversations with Ashok, and he's been um, very helpful in, in every way uh, and willing to work with, with the town wherever, you know, two of us think there are any kind of efficiencies um, to be had. Uh, again, I think just by, by the nature of the types of system differences that we'll see some, you know, and again, I don't, I don't know the schools uh, certainly as well as, as he would, but scheduling software, um, right, G grading software, I mean, the, the kind of things that they're going to have in place, I, just by the nature of that, we're not going to be able to overlap. Um, right, not from the application side. But, but in terms of, uh, again, I mean, another example, though, where, where we are able to, to join forces there is um, like the Google platform. So we've standardized on, on Google for messaging. That's something that holds true for both town and schools. Um, right. So th and that was my, what I was thinking. I don't think there's that many opportunities to collaborate with the schools, you know, because the infrastructure has gone away, right? We don't, we don't have servers anymore, right? And they don't, they use um, the payroll app, the payroll program, they tie to that. They're already tied into all that downstairs, right? So I'm not there's not a lot of Yeah, I mean, I think the, we'll see, you know, there'll always be some amount of infrastructure that, that will need to exist on, on premise. Um, and, and again, I think we, we have that already really um, as efficient as it's going to get in terms of economies of scale and, and working together. Okay. Um, but yes, to your point, I think in the future we'll, we'll, you know, my hope is that we continue to move more and more to the cloud and rely less and less on that on-premise 
uh, processing or, or resources. Okay. On, um, uh, on the website, I agree, it's desperately in need of an update. It definitely is kind of antiquated. And it doesn't work on all platforms, and, you know, it's sort of, it would be nice to make it. I don't know what it would look, what a better website would be, but I think there's got to be a better option out there. Other than that, are there any other major issues, concerns, things that we need to be aware of or um, looking forward to? No, nothing major to be aware of. I think, um, you, you know, again, the, the good news is there's no big red flags here or anything right. that, that I'm seeing um, and saying, oh, my goodness, um, right, we, you know, we, we need to address this yesterday. Um, you know, I'm, I see lots of opportunities for, for small uh, efficiency improvements and where we may be able to be more effective in how we get something done. Um, but, again, this is efficiency and effectiveness-based um, kind of process improvements, not uh, burning systems. Right. Uh, which I think is, is, is good. Good. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. We're good. Thank you for coming in, Josh. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. I made the agenda. Street name acceptance action item. The board will consider approving a street name for three lots on a paper street, which is off Leonard Street. The proposed names are, one, Box Mill Road, two, I think it's Mehern Road, three, Leonard Lane, four, Leonard Circle, and five, Easy Street. Um, there's a request and some permitting comments. The permitting comments primarily consist of the fact that uh, the recommendations by the public safety are, are against anything involving the word Leonard, um, to just to eliminate any kind of confusion. And I'll also remind the board that previously we declined to name a road Easy Street a few years back. We did. Um, we didn't like it. Yeah. You're right. So with that, um, uh, you are here. To I'm the owner. My name's Richard Barbieri. I'm the owner of the property. Okay. I could explain the. Uh, the engineer found there used to be an old box mill on that property years ago and was owned by the Mahern family. That's where those two names came from. Yeah. So I don't know if you have any questions for me. It's a little three-lot paper road that I'm improving. Right. Okay. Any, uh, who wants to start the stuff? Mr. Mosier, any, any uh, questions or no you just want to? No questions. I'm ready to make a motion. Go for it. I think, I think people yeah, listen. I uh, I'll make a motion for box mill road. Second. We have a motion and a second for Box Mill Road. Does anybody else, any competing candidates? Okay, all in favor of Box Mill Road, say aye. 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 Opposed, Perfect. President. Thank you. Order. Welcome to Box Mill Road. Thanks, Mom. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank welcome. you. Item 9, the agenda, liquor licenses, 2016 changes and hours of operation policy discussion action item. The board will review hours of operation policy for restaurants and related establishments and then consider approving nine licensee requests for a change in hours or other aspects of their licenses. This, the board has discussed this a couple times previously. Um, we drafted a policy. We reviewed the policy. The goal for tonight, I think, was for the board to go through the policy one last time. Mr. Kamal, you can talk about the changes we've made or where, we, where it stands. The board can ask any final questions. The goal here is to um, make the next move to be to a public hearing, at, which is required. We're required to post this for anyone who's going to have their hours changed. Um, and then we do that in one of these meetings. And as and we do the public hearing, and then we would vote to implement the policy. Mr. Kamalo, yeah, anything to say? Yes, in, through the chair. In summary, the changes that have been added to the policy uh, subsequent to the board's last meeting include the following. Uh, we have provided more clarity and uh, specified the requirements for the farmers' series pouring licenses. We have also identified the requirements uh, that apply to the special temporary licenses. Remember, this is a concept that uh, we have had in the books for a while, but the town has never specifically uh, laid out the requirements for such licenses. Uh, in addition, we laid out the requirements for the farmer's market license, uh, and these are different from the farmer's series pouring licenses. Uh, the farmer's market licenses pertain strictly to the farmer's market as we have in the common. Uh, the farmer's series pouring licenses are tied to um, local brews that are tied to, in fact, that are related to local farming operations. And then finally, uh, a couple of things that we, we, we laid out in terms of the hours. Remember, the, I had received specific comments from some of the existing establishments with regard to uh, special events. Um, I did provide some uh, suggested hours for New Year's Eve. Um, I laid out 12.30 a.m. as a likely uh, end point uh, for, for that particular night. And then finally, 
fees. Uh, in reviewing this uh, policy, uh, we did identify a couple of issues that the board will need to address perhaps as we move forward. Uh, one being the idea of identifying a base fee for all the applications. And then number two, revising our fee schedule to line up with the new categories and uh, also the new terminology that we're using in the policies um, so that at least when people come to the office, they can quickly identify what the application fee is for that particular license that they may be interested in. So in summary, we've clarified the requirements for the new license types that the board has been discussing, um, including the farmers series, the farmers market, uh, as well as the special temporary licenses. We have also identified new hours for New Year's Eve. I did not touch Sunday night football, Monday night football, Thursday night football. Um, and we have also laid out the general operating requirements for all licenses. Okay, thank you, Mr. Paul. I also want to point out the board today got a letter from the 110 Grill, which is sort of a, um, a detailed discussion. In essence, what they ask is that we not do what we're doing. Um, they recommend that we continue licensing on a case-by-case -case basis um, and address the hours individuals. So that just came in today. Uh, Mr. Herr, questions to start this off? As long as we're moving towards a process where the establishment owners have an opportunity to come in and address the policies that we're considering, <clears throat> I'm very comfortable. I think it's imperative that we notify every establishment in town when that public hearing is going to be held and we post that public hearing wide and far in town for any community members that want to come and weigh in on it uh, so that we don't get any uh, sort of Monday morning quarterbacking going on uh, post a decision that will be made at some point soon. But I think as long as we're moving towards that public process and the public is aware and notified and they participate, we'll make a good decision and we'll be able to move forward. Okay. All good points. Mr. Mosher. Uh, so, so up until today I've heard surprisingly little from um, people that may be affected by this, but I did get a phone call and I think there's a misconception about why the board set out to do this. And my recollection is that we had some annual approvals, the times were all over the place, and there were some new establishments coming into town. <clears throat> and we kind of looked at it and said, um, you know, is there, is there an advantage or a disadvantage to some of these businesses based on, on having individual times? And then there was also uh, some input from the police chief uh, knowing when closing times were, making it a little easier for officers to enforce uh, some of the rules around um, around these licenses. Uh, so that was my perception. It wasn't that we were looking to shut things down and, and um, bring the hammer down on, on uh, businesses, but it was more of a, of a consistency cleanup to make things a little bit easier. Um, to Mr. Herr's point, there, there is a process around this, and we want to do uh, the appropriate thing for the town, for the residents and the businesses. Um, so that's, I guess that's just my piece, um, what the original intent was around taking a comprehensive look at this. It was to clean things up from fairness, consistency, and convenience. Mm -hmm. That's what it was. Mr. Sistari. Silly John. <laughs> um, no, I like this. Uh, I think that, to Mr. Herr's point, we need to make sure that word gets out uh, with ample time so that people's businesses aren't affected, um, you know, as long as they have an opportunity to come in front of us and talk to us about, you know, any variance in the hours that they're requesting and they feel they require. Um, my, my one question is, I know in, during the last discussion, the question came up on the fee for a transfer of license and uh, possibly having that be based on the percentage of the uh, sale price of the license. And I'm wondering if we have an answer to that. Yes. Um, the law in Massachusetts is very clear in terms of establishing fees. Um, fees are based on the time that the town spends reviewing the fee and nothing else. OK. 
Okay. So that would be a no because it can if the take license a long time to review grand, that sale. You're still on charge if it's being sold for five grand. Hmm? Yeah. The answer to your question would be no. Yeah. It can take a long time to review a sale document. Hmm. Okay. Ms. Catino. And me, when I came to the Iowa's, I was just the, was the only dissenter. Um, because I, as much as it might be okay with some of you that, um, you know, the businesses can come fight for, uh, later on they can come and fight for what they have now to try and get, if they have a one o'clock now and we're telling them that five nights a week they have to close at 1130, adding it up, that's seven and a half hours of, of business that they're going to be closed. And for some small businesses, that could be a lot. Um, you know, I think that we that that we probably should have, if we were going to level the playing field, level the playing field and make it easier for the police and give it like a midnight straight across the board or something, and 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 maybe the the businesses wouldn't take as big a hit, as opposed to eleven eleven thirty five days a week. Can I jump in real quick, Mr. Har? So are, are you done? I'm sorry. Are you for that, but, but he may not be. He may not be after I speak. No, it's fine. Hey, I, I, we've, we've, we've gone at it before. Do you have things you want to say? No, that, that's uh, that's, that's fine. Okay, so fine, Mr. Hurry. Yes. So in this chair, I haven't voted on anything. I'm not a dissenter or a proponent of anything until we have the public hearing and we hear from the community and we hear from the ownership and the establishment about what their concerns are. I haven't made a decision about anything. So I think you're with all due respect, jumping the gun saying you're the only dissenter. I might be a dissenter too. I don't have the facts yet. Don't, I don't want to put a message out there that this is a done deal. It's not a done deal at all. It's not a done deal in my mind. And I don't want a message to the public that it's a done deal until we have the public hearing. I can tell you want to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, the document says draft right on it. And we've had, we've had minimal input from establishment owners. I think we did have, we did have uh, one person in here the last time we was actually about. okay with the changes yeah, but they were here okay. for another reason they yeah. weren't even here yeah, for the, right. Right. you know it was okay with the changes and we've continued to refine this document so um you haven't dissented yet from i think the point is well, no, no but when we, when we were drafting this we could have drafted it for 1 a.m and then said okay now come back and discuss it no but we drafted it at 11 35 days a week and and all right so let's, but let's talk right. about what the board does here right the board the board takes does what we think is is proper after deliberation we did talk about the fact that we do i think there's a general consensus that we at least perceive there to be some difference between businesses that are downtown in a heavily residential district and non-residential district businesses right and we and to the extent we've gotten feedback so far i've heard no one but you push for one o'clock right i've had no business come in and say i want to be open to one o'clock seven days a week so I, I think it is important to point. You know, I think you're trying to create a distinction from yourself from the rest of the board that, does, that the board doesn't feel exists. I think everyone's drafted this. I think there's a public hearing process for a reason, and, and then we'll we'll refine it based upon that. Okay. Question? Anything else? Does anybody want, want to change any of these things before we post a public hearing? Mr. Kamal, do you have any thoughts on this, or you, in your mind, is this right to go to a public hearing? I think uh, for the public's interest, my understanding of the process so far has been the board thoughtfully <coughs> going through the issues that the policy may address. Secondly, at staff level, we also did have an informational meeting with some of the key establishments that will be impacted by this gather their feedback, and we'll share it with the board as part of the uh, uh, public hearing process. And thirdly, we have re uh, the board has reiterated at every meeting that there will be a public hearing uh, for this process. And as part of that public hearing, staff is required, the town is required to contact all the establishments that are impacted by this. So that will happen. Uh, and then thirdly, we are also uh, maintaining our lines of communication open with the establishments. Uh, some of them are here tonight, and we'll also be inviting them to, to the public hearing. Uh, the goal, again, has been for the board to at least put together a document that will be available at least 14 days before the public hearing for everybody to review. 
Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Mr. Sestari, you had a follow-on. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, I'd like to ask the town manager on the license fees, the transfer of license, how accurate would you say $100 is to the cost that's incurred by the town to review documents that pertain uh, to a new liquor license or a new, a new purveyor in town uh, with respect to town council, public safety, uh, people here in town hall, and anybody else who's involved. Uh, would you say it's less than $100 or $100? The time spent by, t by town staff and town resources is substantially higher than $100. Okay. Closer to so it seems to me like we should be able to come up with a better number than $100 for the transfer of license. As a general comment, we should make sure the fees obviously are covering the cost. I think a, 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 um, a market study of the fee would make sense. Just a quick call to the surrounding communities because that sounds extremely low Mr. Kamal. in this day and age. Through the chair, we have an established two-step process for recommending fees for the board's consideration. First step, we do a detailed review and analysis of the times actually spent processing the application. We then seek information from surrounding towns purely as a point of reference, not necessarily as the reason for establishing the fee. Okay. Mr. Marger, over to you. Uh, the chair, uh, Mr. Paul, you mentioned you'd spoken to some, some establishments in town. Um, could you just kind of summarize what the feedback was or if there's anything specific the board should be aware of? Yes. Um, I met with uh, representatives from the establishments that currently close at 1 a.m. Uh, there were four establishments represented at that meeting. There appeared to be concerns with regard to how the proposed hours could impact um, days that the establishments have established over time as event nights. Uh, I mentioned Sunday night football, Monday night football, Thursday night football, uh, as well as New Year's Eve. Um, the second concern was that there are establishments in town that have clearly created a late dinner niche in the market. In other words, they are known as establishments that uh, people visit at 10, 10.30 to get a meal. And they felt that they were going to be losing those customers. So, uh, well, I'll let John keep going. For, I'll come just, to you. Just next. a quick follow-on question: um, Would it be appropriate to ask the um, the um, department heads that weigh in on permitting maybe to put a report together for the town that would outline if there's any history of noise complaints or public safety issues around these these closing times that because I don't know if there's information that may or might, may not be there could we put our town professionals on that say yes there is this issue and or maybe no there isn't this issue that we could take into consideration well again members yeah. of the public can come to the thing too and talk about right, whether it right. impacts their lives or not y yes and the the draft policy will be circulated to the permitting team for comments Okay. Mr. Herr. You know, I haven't been doing this for a while because I have five kids, but I think Boston, everything closes at 1 a.m. Is that true? Is that, does that sound familiar to everybody? Is it 1 or 2 a.m.? Whatever it is. But it's, I think, across the city everywhere for bars and restaurants. And some close well before that because the business dies off and they say, okay, we're going home for tonight. Um, and I, I guess that's my goal here is to try and be uniform in how we do it. I don't care if it's 1 o'clock. If that's what the people think and that's what the businesses suggest and that's what, uh, uh, you know, the community wants, I'm fine with that. But I think we just need to be consistent in that time. We can't give one a 1 o'clock license and say to somebody else, you're closing at 11. That's, I think, highly discriminatory and unfair business. Um, that said... You know, in the 15, 16 years I've been in town, I can't remember the last time I was in a pub or a restaurant in Hopkinton at 1 a.m. that was open. Not that I wasn't there when they were closed either, for that matter. But I don't know who these four places are where they're serving food, and that's going on till 1 o'clock in the morning. Now, maybe I've just become a boring old guy, but I, I just, 
I don't care, but we have to be, have to be consistent, in my opinion. Well, again, that's what the public hearing's for, right? Is right. to hear, is let folks, it's basically come out now and, you know, say what you think, so. Okay. What? Go ahead. Um, I, I just, I hate to, you know, keep my questions on the same subject. Back to the fees. <laughs> let's get back to money. <laughs> um, so, I, Mr. Kamalo, I just want to put out a hypothetical so I understand uh, when monies are paid. John's restaurant uh, decides to sell to Ben's restaurant. And Ben's restaurant comes in in the middle of the year and they want to uh, have John's Restaurant transfer their liquor license. They have an all-alcoholic beverages license. The transfer of the license costs $100 according to, this, uh, according to this schedule. Is there any other money that needs to come to Town Hall? Does Ben's Restaurant pay that year, that first year, do they pay an additional $1,800 for the all-alcoholic beverages license, or are they only paying the $100 transfer fee? I'll defer to Maria on this one. Um, I guess it's just a transfer fee. So Maria, just, just the $100. Dollars. So the well, my, what my suggestion would be is every, we're going to do the same due diligence on this new restaurant as we would uh, <clears throat> any other restaurant if it was a fresh new license. So I think the fees should be the same. In so why can't we have... Uh, you know, if we have to break it out, have an all alcohol restaurant, all alcoholic beverages transfer fee license that's the same as what the fresh license is, $1,800. And then an, a restaurant wine and malt only license, transfer license, that's $1,200 and break it out like that. Because it seems like it's, there's justification, it's, it's the same amount of work. If I may, in, in fact, the proposal you'll receive from staff will be along those lines. Um, we, we did discuss at least having a transfer fee for poor licenses, substantially higher than what we have at the moment. However, there are also simpler transfers, for example, change in manager, transferring part of the ownership to an individual part of management. We are going to have a, we are going to propose uh, a, 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 a lesser a fee for those kinds of transfers. Mm -hmm. But your okay. point is well taken. That's okay. what we're going to do. I won't talk about these fees anymore tonight. Okay. Anybody else got any comments on this before we move on? Okay. Two, three, I'm okay. oh, good. Go okay. On. So um, all right, so why don't we go off, make those changes, and then let's post a public hearing for um, I mean public Realistically, a month or so, right, Mr. Kamalo? Yeah. I mean, we should kind of end up end of March, maybe early April. Good. Liaison reports, board events, and invitations. Uh, Mr. Sestari, any liaison reports? Um, just continuing to meet with uh, the Charter Review Committee. Um, we have gotten through three chapters. <laughs> And uh, some great input from, from the group, um, you know, and it's also helpful. Uh, we've had uh, Ray or representatives of his firm there for each meeting, and we're making progress. It's um, lots of discussion, so the, uh, the progress is sometimes slow, but at this point it seems like we've, we've got some time. So. Okay. Good. Mr. Patino. Yeah, um, last night I presented... Uh, six bylaw changes to the um, planning board. Um, there were actually 12, but we combined several of them for uh, there's a, some changes to the signed bylaws. That's, that's the, we don't need exact updates. No, but that, that, <laughs> I'm planning board. Okay, are you planning board, board liaison? Board. Okay. Planning board liaison. Okay. Yes, well, they're, they're, they're going to be, they're going to be on the town meeting more. And, uh -huh. You know, people are going to have to sit through those. But it would have been 12, and we reduced it down to six. And, uh, but, and there are some, uh, some good ones. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that. If you want to keep cutting me off, it's okay. Ouch. Getting testy here. Mr. Mosier. I don't have any updates, Mr. Oh, Chair. sure. He could have yielded some time to me. Okay, and Mr. Herr will get, pick up with him. Uh, in terms of invitations for the board, Lieutenant Wallace is having a retirement party this weekend. Um, 
I unfortunately have long-standing plans to be out of town, so hopefully someone can attend that from the board. Um, huh? March 11th. No, February 27th. Yes, but... Oh, and then, the, yeah, 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 I was going to do that one. Yeah, 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 we'll get to that. Okay, so, um, so we should figure out who, can, who in the board can go to that one. And Mr. Kamal, we can pay for that out of the Selectman's account, right, because that's an official activity. So we should, anybody who goes and has to pay, I think that's covered by the Selectman's account. My other, my other report would be uh, the fact that we have now scheduled the library groundbreaking for March 11th, 10 a.m., so everyone should uh, mark their calendars. It'll be a uh, large event. Um, March 11th, it's a Friday at 10 a.m., so uh, three weeks, right? So There's no significance to that date, too. I don't know. Always birthday. Or the cake. So, um, so that's, yeah, so that's the next big event. On the town manager's report, Mr. Kamalo. Um, Mr. Chair, with your permission, I would like to add a request uh, that the board uh, authorize a letter of support uh, for a grant application that we're putting in to support the town's trails project. When's it due? Due yesterday. Okay, so fine. I'll add to the agenda then. So there's a, there's a definite need to get this done. Okay, so go ahead. So, so, yeah, the, uh, therefore, the first item is I'm requesting the board's authorization uh, for the chair to uh, sign a letter of support uh, to a grant application that the Upper Charles Trails Committee, working with the Land Use Director, uh, has submitted to this date. And that application is currently under review, and we're very optimistic that uh, the town has put together a very competitive application. Okay. Any questions on the grant letter from anybody? Uh, Chairman, I intend a motion to approve the execution of a letter in support of the grant for the trails. So moved. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? President voting. That's unanimous. Okay, Mr. Kamal, we'll sign that letter after the meeting. Okay. E.L. Harvey contract. Um, as we know, the uh, current contract expires end of June this year. Um, I'm advising the board that I've already, uh, together with the DPW director, started uh, conversations with E.L. Harvey. Uh, in terms of how we could proceed, uh, depending on our preliminary conversations, the town, town may at least be faced with two options. One option is looking at um, uh, an extension to the existing contract or simply go out and do an RFP. Okay, so the contract expires June 30th, yes. so the board has to decide quickly what we want to do. Um, uh, so I guess we should have a discussion about this at the board level. So how do people feel about revisiting the harvest contract in full versus just going and offering a, 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 a rec, a, uh, extension? So in revisiting the contract, that revisits the question of what the contract scope is, which revisits the uh, type of services they provide and the methods in which the residents utilize those services, et cetera, right? Correct. Um, so... Just so we understand what the deal is. Yeah. Mr. Kamala, do you have something to add? The scope of the contract is already defined. It's, it, it covers solid waste. Okay, I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> it means trash. Recycling are all covered in the contract. Right. So let's let's just get right to it, right? Yeah. So so the question is the question is how deep do you want to go down the rabbit hole, right? So so we can can we and at, right the big question is do we want to go single stream? Do we want to go fully automated? All those kind of questions. So, Mr. Kamal, can we do that in the context of an extension of the contract? Can we have those conversations, or would that be such a change we'd have to go out and do a whole new RFP? I think that's kind of where Mr. Hur was going to. Like, does that? Does that fundamentally cause us to have to start a whole new process? It, it can be uh, discussed in the context of an extension of the existing contract. Okay. Because there is reference to... Those items. To automation. Okay. Already. So we don't have to go through an RFP process to revisit those if the board should choose to. That is correct. And also, by, by law, we, the town is not compelled to do an RFP for waste management contracts. Oh, really? Okay. So maybe why don't we keep this high level in the start? I guess the question for the board is, does the board want Mr. Kamal to look into doing, to extending the harvest contract, or is there any desire to go out and do an RFP and look for a broader change? 
What the extension would entail is a whole different question, or can be a whole different question, is what I just heard. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm not going to I'm not going to say that I'm displeased at any level with uh, with the current service and provider. I guess my biggest question is: Is it our fiduciary responsibility to put this out to bid because it's a it's a large contract, and we've been with the same vendor for how long now? been here six seven years now mm-hmm. and all my time here we've hit Ian Harvey yeah I mean Is you know and again I, I have no issues with with the service that's been provided I'm just you know questioning whether and and what what's the dollar value of the annual dollar value of the contract it's pretty substantial around I say six hundred and fifty thousand. Yeah, it's, it's over half yeah. a million bucks okay. so a little north of that I mean you know I would I would hope <coughs> that if you know Whatever, whatever we were getting, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, insurance or trash pickup or things like that, you know, for a number like that, I would hope that at the end of a contract, you know, we have to, we have to consider uh, putting out some type of an RFP. Well, it so sounds like we can negotiate, too. We could negotiate yeah. an extension that to, our, to, to our benefit, and obviously mm-hmm. we want to win-win for them, too, but we want to negotiate, I think, as well. I think that's an option. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Well, and, and also just to co- not to dissuade any of us, but just to point this out, though, if we do that, that's going to mean setting a scope of services, which is going to, again, inherently involve a discussion of all those topics that came up last time, the recycling, the single stream, the, the bins, all that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. just, we should just be prepared for a, a large conversation if we do that. Mm-hmm. Okay. And we're going to have to probably have that conversation early on because we're going to have to do that to be able to get bids. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mr. Mosher, you've been quiet. Yeah, I'd love to have the conversation. Um, I think single stream would just be easier for one. Um, <clears throat> I think it would keep things a lot cleaner. Um, last few windy days we've had, I've seen a lot of a lot of stuff blowing out of recycling bins and trash bins and things like that. It would be great to have some better um, receptacles for that sort of thing. Um, some people have asked questions about the size of the barrels, and I'd be interested to see if there's flexibility around the size. If people choose to have a smaller size, um, the recycling bin was pretty ginormous that we saw last time, <clears throat> and I think there was a substantial savings to the taxpayers also. So, Mr. Kamal, I think what we should probably do is maybe for the board to consider maybe we could have like a little, just even just a bullet point list of key elements we have to decide what we want to do before to do it. I think we should be gearing up for an RFP, is what I think I'm hearing from the board. We should be. You, would, I, I guess uh, uh, you nod your head, but I, so I guess I took it as a sign. Yeah, I, I just I just want to make sure that we don't uh, do a re, uh, re, reduction in uh, in services okay. throughout this this whole thing. Four years ago, we we went from unlimited to two barrels of trash, and I just want to make sure that since we just passed that nine million dollars, that people uh, are paying more this year, that we're not going to give them less. You know, and I think that to Mr. Herr's point, it's, you know, it's probably also worth a, a quick conversation uh, with, with uh, E.L. Harvey as well. Um, About what, though? I mean, I, th- I thought you just said a minute ago, I thought you wanted to do an RFP and get it put out to bid. Well, um, you know, I think that, I think that uh, if, if we were in a situation where we can justify not putting things out to bid, then I think that's fine. Yeah, so I'm not trying to be difficult. I just want to understand what. Um, um, how would you know that? Given that you said you want to put up for big, you want to make sure the cost is right. How will you know the cost is right if we don't have comparators? I think if the cost were, if if the I'll come, I'll if the burden on the taxpayers were coming down for the for the level of service that we have right now, okay. I think that. Okay. So if we can get a cheaper contract at, at any level, you're you'd be content to not put this out. Okay. Mr. Kamal, did you say, were you going to say something? I'll come to you in a second. I just want to make sure you didn't know anything important. Yes. Um, in, it, in, in fact, it expands on uh, Mr. Sestari's point that I think tactically it's helpful for, for staff to sit down with E.L. Harvey and get a sense as to what direction the contract may take going forward. In terms of comparisons, 
we are pretty familiar with the numbers that are out there. We share this information with our partners. And most importantly, there's, a, there's an individual at state level who's assigned to assist us as towns when okay. we go through this, mm. this contract process. So mm. we do have the market basket okay. comparison. So you don't have can, to necessarily go out to bid to know. Exactly. Okay. And we can make a quick decision in terms of is the, is, is the information we're getting from Harvey's mm -hmm. advantageous to this community or not. Okay. Uh, and we also factor in the town's long-term goals. Uh, you may get a great contract uh, for, for two years, which may not necessarily support the town's long-term goals. Yeah. Um, so there are several considerations that we take into account in and, deciding whether to stay with the, the existing contractor or go out to RFP. Yeah, and I also don't want to discount the value in having a local vendor as well and, and a partnership between, uh, you know, businesses within the town and the town itself. So, um, you know, don't think I'm discounting that either. So. Okay. All right, so, Mr. Kamal, why don't we plan? You, I'm sorry. No, sorry. You, Mr. Heard, do you have something were you going to say? My, my only thought is I'm not inclined to go to RFP. I'm more inclined to negotiate with our yeah. current supplier uh, to improve services and try and work for the taxpayer's benefit. Okay. Um, with an understanding that that would also, I think, include scope of services and how we do what we do at the curb. All right, Mr. Kamal, so why don't we, we, why don't we start the conversation with Harvey's about an extension? I think you heard the pressure points. We don't want reduction in service. We do want reduction in expense. And I think we need to revisit these topics that we didn't come to conclusion on last time with regard to automated trash collection and single stream recycling. Sensitive to the questions that were raised by the board previously um, on an, in a number of different ways about those topics. But I do think, I do think we've heard from the community that there's a desire to to move in that direction, so we should see if it could be done reasonably. If I could okay. just add Please. one other thought, and I would, I would encourage us to consider a phased approach over a period of time to any changes that some may view as being drastic. Okay. Let's just walk before we run as we move into a recycling, the age of recycling in Hawkington. Uh, okay. So, uh, Mr. Moses. <clears throat> Mr. Catino brought up the point of expanding services. And to Mr. Herr's point, and I've heard this from several members of the community about considering weekly recycling. So maybe that's something we look into as, as an option. Right. Again, my guess is all this stuff starts to come together, right? Because you've mm -hmm. you got to get the cost down if you want to do that kind of thing and not see. That means you probably go in single stream, which means you're probably having to talk about the bin. So this is all going to get tied together, I suspect. In so, some so this may be a matrix. crazy. What is single stream? Everything goes in one. Everything in the same Everything bucket. goes in one bucket. So plastics, cans, paper. Everything. Every one everything goes in one can. Kind remember like they. Some, remember they. Like some well, isn't that of my easier family for do us? Now. <clears throat> it is. It's easier. Yeah. It is. The the issue last time was <clears throat> everyone liked it except the cans were ginormous, and so that was the issue for for folks. Did the cans have wheels? Yeah, but they were big. I mean, like actually, we can actually like we can mix the, mix them now. All right. Okay, so we can get into the weeds later, but I think we can get into it. And then they wanted to go automated, which meant they had to have all the same can, which meant they wanted to give everybody new cans. Well, there's the part where I'm saying walk before we run. Well, again, I, but I, don't, I, I hear you, except I don't know that it's not all tied together because, you know, exclusive. there's only so many ways you can cut the cost, right? One of them is the guys don't have to go to the truck anymore and get pick the stuff up, which means you've got to have a can you can pick up in every case. So, it, again, we're going to have to okay. work through a matrix, I suspect. All right, Ms. Kamal. But I still think we should, you know, we, should, we can't discount a, um, a local employer that um, brings a lot back to the community. Okay. So, good. So, we're going to work on the contract. Right. Next, Mr. Kamal. With your permission, Mr. Chair, let me jump on to number three, the two or three point street realizing. Yep. Uh, the proponent is here. Um, the conservation restriction proposed for 203 Pond Street has been reviewed by all entities, hauled um, the state agency as well as Ray Mieres' office, and they've all approved the language as presented. Okay. Uh, Dave, Good evening, hi. Mr. Chairman. How are you? I've been better. <laughs> Shouldn't have asked. So, no, I'm, dealing with um, I'm dealing with one disaster after another. So. Okay. Well, I'm sorry to hear, but thank you for coming in tonight. Um, this so. cold weather really did a number on my house at the Cape, so. Huh. Anyway, it's been a three-year process uh, for 203 Pond. Um, we're about to have signed the CR for the 32.34 acres. Um, 
We've done the surveying of the property, the and um, <laughs> I was trying to say thank we've you. spent a lot of time preparing this, the conservation restriction documents. There was some last-minute changes. Uh, John is now living, uh, Mr. Coolidge is now living up in New Hampshire, and so the New Hampshire address and uh, New Hampshire um, notary has been affixed to, to the document. I have two copies for signature and four copies just for uh, your use. I haven't signed this document as yet, but essentially what we're saying awesome. is, do you want? Yeah, I'll take it. Yeah, sure. Thank you. four copies there. Right on. I have the two signature copies, which I will sign. Maria can, um, These are for execution, Dave? Those are the corrected yeah. editions, yes. For, for execution. Okay. Excuse me? For execution, for signature. No, we I need, have the signature copies. So these are just for us to look, th look Those at? Those are just for you guys to... to yeah, we have electronically. I didn't realize. I thought you were To enjoy, so... Um, I'm wondering if... Um, at the present time, there's um, a trail, or are trails on the property. This is all your stuff. Okay. There will be um, more trails. There will be a parking <clears throat> area off street that will house six or seven cars. Uh, similar or maybe even larger than the one that we've prepared up at Whisper Way. Um, I don't know if anybody's been up to Whisper Way to see that. Uh, and that is going to be and is a premier property. We've had a lot of action up there. Uh, the the um, geocache is getting a lot of action. The trail is getting a lot of action. So we're here to have this signed off. I'm wondering if anybody has any questions. <clears throat> okay, questions from the board. Ms. Catino. No, this is, this is something that the uh, Trails Committee has been looking forward to, and, and it's a big exchange. I'm really happy about this. All I can tell you is we walked there in the fall, and I came home with about a half a dozen to a dozen ticks. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's ticky. It's, yeah. it's, it's a good property. The trails will be premier trails that will go over to both Whitehall Conservation Area across the, the street and also the Epton State Forest. Okay. Mr. Mosier. And it will be open to equestrian. Uh, Mr. Mosier. And bike riding. Mr. Mosier, one more time. No questions. I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Herr. All this is in line with the deal, the sale of the land, everything else that was agreed yes. prior. Yes. As a matter of fact, um, SVT is getting the land, and uh, as soon as this comes back from the state, uh, the land will be transferred over to SVT. I think it's great. I've, I have discovered trail running in Hopkinton in the last year, and it, it's awesome. So I'm excited for the town, and um, I think it's a great opportunity. Okay. Mr. Catino, I mean, Mrs. Estari. No questions. Dave, my question. So who owns this land? The Right now, John Coolidge owns the, John and Ann own the land. It will be transferred to Sudbury Valley trustees uh, at the same time that this gets recorded when it comes back from the state. So it'll be owned by SVT. It will be owned by SVT and will be <coughs> managed by us. The whole Hopkin Area Land Trust right. will manage the property under this conservation restriction. Okay. The town council has. Yes. Yes. There's review. The, the the selectman's involvement is purely administrative. Right. Again, Valley owns, yeah, owns it. Court oversees and manages locally, yeah. and by law, the selectmen are supposed to are required to sign. That. Okay. Right. Well, before we, I'm sorry, Mr. Hurd, go ahead. Um, oh, can we, Dave? Um, how do you, did we, didn't we have an agreement before about how you're going to name things? Here's why I'm asking you. No, you I drive into Fruit Street property and I see trails that you all have named, and I don't know how or why. Okay. You had, so, because it's on town land. Correct. So, how do you, didn't we come to an agreement before about, about how you're going to not name things on <laughs> without the Board of Selectmen's approval on town land? Yeah. On town land, the board passed the policy that the board would select the name for the property itself. Right. It has nothing to do with the trails. The trails are... The names of the trails were done in conjunction with SVT, and the names of the trails are entirely separate from the name of the property. Yeah, that to me is a difference without a distinction. <laughs> I think that, or a distinction without a difference. I think you, I think you went in between, uh, in the, the line, I think you went outside the lines trying to stay within the lines on that one, and I don't, I, I 
don't like what you've done. I, I'm not, and because I think you're trying to avoid the selectman's clear desire, which was we name things on town property, not you all independently of us. In every, circuit, in every single circumstance in town, every single town-owned asset, the Board of Selectmen decides what the name of it is. And I'm very disturbed by the fact that I'm going into town properties and there are Only one. named assets, there are named assets that, are, that were not run by the town for Only approval one. first. Doesn't matter. And, I'm not, and, I have no, and I have no qualms with the specifics of that name. I do not like the way you're executing that policy, though, and I, want, I think, I, I, from my perspective, and I'll, I'll let my colleagues talk, I think you need to stop that because I think that's going to be a problem for us conveying things to you in the future. Okay, I, I, I understand. So I want, I want to be very clear about that. I understand that. entirely. Um, I guess I must apologize then for not coming to the board and suggesting the name for that particular trail. Um, we will in the future come back to the board. If it's a town property and we hold the conservation restriction, we will propose names for the trails and you guys can approve them. Ms. Kamal, am I overstepping the board's authority on this one? Just, I mean, okay. I don't believe so. Just want to make sure. Because yeah. Mr. Goldman, as you heard, had, a, had, a different, had an alternate view. Yes, sir. So it's a new discussion for me anyway <laughs> in terms of na uh, naming trails. I can understand the concern. Which yep. trail are you talking about? There's a trail Red on the trail. Fruit Street. Yeah, there's a trail on the Fruit Street property that, that they named. It's on town property, and they named it. And I and I have no. I don't. I don't mind the name. It's not right. the name. What I don't like is the fact that we've we made clear to him because I remember I was you know we made clear to him we want we name things, and all of a sudden these names start showing up, and we have we never even knew about it. Uh, uh, I, I, and so if you guys are open to it, I think it makes sense because we're consistently talking about names, you know, on streets. With all due respect, Mr. Chairman, yeah. it's not showing up everywhere. It's the one trail. Oh, well, again, that's the one I see because I drive past all the time in the spring. I didn't know that until you just told me that. It all I the, saw was one it example. It is the one okay. and only trail that we took the liberty of naming without coming to the board. But going forward, because we just bought a lot of land that's going to have some trails on it here in the next few years, going forward, you guys will come and we'll talk. Right. Well, and part of the reason I'm perturbed is it would have been much better named on the, on the new land we just bought, right? So we could, you know, there would have been a better, if we could have talked about this first, we could have had a, an equally good, if not better solution that well, would have been, would have taken into account our you know, our views, which... Let me, let me propose the following. We're proposing to put another trail in the Fruit Street property, and the name we would propose is the Pratt Trail North Section, and we will come to the board with a letter that says that's what our proposal is, and if that's not what the board's desire is, then we will propose other names. All right. I do, not th I do not think it is a matter of policy. You should name anything without running it by the board, if it's on town property. Okay. I, I and agree, we, I agree we, with that. And we have not done so other than that trail. Okay. Well, you're about to do it a second time, it sounds like. So, don't, yeah, don't. Because, again, again, Dave, think about, think about in the context of the farm itself, right? I mean, there's stuff yes. we can do there. So, I'd like, to, I'd like to have this conversation. I'm not against any names, any names specifically. Easy Street. I do want to, I do want to, right, exactly. <laughs> unless you want to name an Easy Street. We're never well, going to go for Easy Street. Well, the trails, <laughs> the, north, the North Section Trail could indeed go into the, the Pratt property that the town now owns. Right. In the future, and it can carry the same name. Well, again, I, okay. Well, again, we'll have Could. a conversation when you we'll come in. We'll have a conversation. When you come in, we'll have the conversation. But I don't, you know, we don't need the, the, that. You know, we can sprinkle names around, right? There's other names in town. For the record, so, for yeah. this particular property, we're call, we're proposing to call it Whitehall Woods. Yeah. Okay. The reason we're going to do that is the Whitehall Woods Alliance was involved in, as you guys know, the the attempt to have the town buy the property in its entirety and. Uh, we felt it appropriate to name it Whitehall Woods. You own that land, so what it, whatever you do well, with that Sudbury is not my does, concern. We, we have yeah, the I mean, street. right. We don't think the town should be involved in naming that particular property. I agree with you. But for the record, I'm okay. stating what it's going to be so that you guys have no question about what it is when it shows up as Whitehall Woods. Right. And again, if it's, owned, if it's not owned by the town, you do as you like, obviously. But Indeed. I just want to make very clear that... that there should be no more naming of any assets without coming to the selectmen. I hear you, and I respect the, okay. the, the, the comment, and you will not see it happen again. Thank you, sir. We will come before the board and request, suggest and request that you approve the name that we select. Okay. If you don't want that name, then we will suggest other names to you. Well, I do think one thing that might benefit you before you just come to us would be to go to some of those entities that are involved in laying the lands out and let's think about naming stuff in a holistic fashion right let's maybe maybe rather just do this chunk and this chunk you know but the Pratt farm mass you know master plan folks are working now the fruit street obviously there's you know people involved 
you know, maybe maybe a better pathway would be rather than just coming incrementally, let's figure it all out and then do That's it all fine. at once. I don't have a problem with that. Okay. I don't think the board will have, a, my board will have a problem yeah. with that. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm not against anything. I just want to, you know, I like to be thoughtful. Okay. Uh, with that, unless there's any more questions about the matter at hand, which is the CR, uh, the chair will entertain a motion to approve the conservation restriction on two or three Pond Street. So moved. Motion? Second. Second. Any further discussion? Questions for Mr. Hart? Town Council's been through the CR. Town Council's all good. Yes. Okay. I'm all set. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, present on voting. That's unanimous. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate it. Thank you for putting I'm going to see Maria sign this and leave it for you guys to sign. Um, I'd like to get two copies signed if that's possible. Of course. These are your papers. That's, that was in the bottom of the stack of stuff you gave oh, me. Oh, sorry about that. That's all right. I just didn't want to keep it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Kamalo, next. Um, staffing updates. I... Uh, I hereby advise the board on the steps that the town manager's office will be taking in filling uh, the operations assistant to the town manager's office position. Uh, I have shared with you an outline of the uh, steps that I will be taking. Um, I just want to walk you through uh, briefly um, the, the steps that are outlined in the memo that I shared with you. Um, first, defining the need. Um, this, this need is driven by the opportunity presented by Jamie's resignation, uh, and I believe it also presents us uh, with a strategic uh, opportunity to uh, at least address some of the long-term needs of the uh, town as well as the town manager's office. Um, I am proposing uh, that Elaine Lazarus assume the bulk of the duties and responsibilities previously performed by Jamie. Um, the question is, what does this accomplish uh, for the town? Um, I have outlined in my memo um, at least uh, one, two, three, four, five, about six or seven uh, immediate benefits to the community. Uh, one is we will have an individual who is familiar with the land use processes in town now working uh, together with the Board of Selectmen as well as the Town Manager on economic development issues. I think that's a plus given some of the most recent uh, developments in town. Um, we will also have this individual participating in the administration uh, and the administrative as well as uh, operational functions of, of town government. I think that's an added advantage in at least bringing together the administrative side as well as the land use side of town government. Uh, she will continue to provide staff support to key um, and strategic boards in town. Uh, these include the Upper Charles Trails Committee. Uh, as we know, this, this committee is uh, intensely involved in a major project in town, and I think having somebody at a senior level continue to work with that committee would be advantageous. Uh, similarly, she will also continue her work with the Zoning Advisory Committee uh, as well as the Evin Todaro Properties Advisory Group. Um, we will also have this position attend to special projects in town. Uh, these are projects that come in on an ad hoc basis and require our immediate attention. Uh, for example, we are currently working with uh, all town departments uh, to develop performance metrics uh, for the individual departments. Uh, she, will be, she will become the point person uh, for that project. Uh, in addition, she will uh, now take over the responsibilities for overseeing the town's risk management program. Uh, this is a program that has resulted over the years in substantial efficiencies and savings for the community, and we want to continue to have somebody at a senior level oversee this work. Uh, she will also become the point person uh, in managing our grant writing. Uh, as you heard from the finance director, we are, I think, doing very well as a town in bringing grant resources. Uh, in FY16, uh, we have already brought in over $5 million worth uh, uh, of grants to this community. Uh, and finally, um, we believe by having Elaine uh, uh, in this position, uh, that, will, um, that, that process will strengthen the town's administration uh, 
in, in, in the form of having somebody dedicated to focusing on operations. Um, that in itself therefore frees the town manager to focus on the key, large, big picture strategic goals of the town. Uh, quantitative benefits for the town, I think as I said, better integration between land use and town administration, uh, integration of economic development uh, into um, the land use uh, processes, uh, I think that's that, that will result in a better product for our business community as well as our residents. Uh, and also, we, uh, by doing so, we are providing uh, an opportunity for professional growth uh, and enhancing our leadership pipeline for uh, an in-house staff person. Uh, it's always great when the town looks inward um, um, uh, for some of these uh, senior leadership, uh, leadership positions. What happens to the current um, duties that Elaine performs for the land use departments. Jennifer Beck, the principal planner, will take over support to the planning board. Uh, will, I, Elaine will continue to work with Jennifer in completing the updating of the master plan. Uh, Elaine will also continue to monitor the implementation of legacy farms. This is a substantial project. She has the history of the project. Uh, and she's more familiar with the community expectations, and I believe she's better placed to monitor the implementation of the project. Um, we also uh, would like uh, to see Elaine uh, focusing on some of the um, you know, staff support uh, that I normally do with the HR department. This will see her interacting um, um, more closely with the other department heads and the senior leadership of the town. Uh, Brian, in answer to your question, is the funding for this position budgeted? Yes, it is. Uh, there will be uh, savings at least in FY16, given the fact that um, we will not be filling uh, the uh, G position that Jamie vacated. Um, what do we need to do as an organization to make, to make sure that uh, Elaine is successful? I think town government will need to present this role uh, as one that will pick up meaningful, <coughs> challenging work. Uh, and also provide uh, the required development support that normally would come from HR uh, to Elaine. Implementation plan, um, I'm, I want to do this immediately. Uh, I have been in conversations uh, with Elaine. She's excited about this opportunity. Uh, I have talked with the chair of the planning board. He understands why we need to do this. Um, um, and what are the risks? I think, I think there will be a learning curve. Uh, for both Elaine as well as Jennifer Beck, uh, and you will see the normal transition cost that you, you get whenever you uh, promote one individual to another position. Um, we will also uh, commit to having the town manager and HR continue to monitor and evaluate the implementation of this proposal. Take any questions from the board. Again, the idea here is to have Elaine assume the bulk of the responsibilities that were previously performed by Jamie that moves it down to the uh, town manager's office. Uh, mm. The question may be, what is her title? Clearly, the title is moving her role more towards the assistant town manager role. Right. Mr. Moj, you're ready to start. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, so Norman, there's, there's a few things. There's a lot in here that I like. There's a couple things I'm not sure if I like, but I, I want to um, I want to make sure I got this straight. So, uh, so you just wrap that up and then alluded to the assistant town manager's role and and one of the things that i don't like about looking at this is filling the operations assistant role um, i think elaine's held a position that's senior to the operations assistant for for several years now uh, both in pay and both been in responsibility and and so i think we need to define the role what what it is she's going to be doing i mean jamie a, a large portion of what he did was administrative work great relationships with the community and customer service and all that sort of thing but um, and I think last year prior to budget uh, budget season or during budget season we talked about the assistant town manager's role I mean that's that's really what we should probably be growing towards right and and to me this proposal looks a little bit like shoehorning into the role that Jamie had and I'm not sure why we don't just talk about like director of operations or assistant town manager what it is what it is that we really need what it is you're really trying to get to 
Go ahead. Um, I, I think overall, you, I think as the board did experience this, and I think the community saw this, yes, Jamie was brought in to do administrative work. On the ground, the town was getting more from that position than what we're giving back to, um, to Jamie. Uh, so day to day, um, Jamie was acting, in fact, as, as a chief of staff. Um, he was attending to customer requests, not necessarily from an administrative viewpoint, but rather from let's get it done. Uh, he, for example, if there was a question coming to the office regarding a service provided, let's say, by DPW, Jamie's role was to make sure that he interacts with the director to make sure that that, that, that piece. But Mr. Kamal, this goes to the title, though. I think it was his, right, the title is. The, the title and some yes. of the job, the job expectations, I think, that Elaine's got. A more administrative. Tons of yeah. this planning experience. I think she has a master's degree now or is close to it, correct? And while Jamie kind of grew that role up, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that moving from director of land use and planning into operations assistant is the lateral move and and is the Both. position that she's moving into really the role that that we think the town needs to be clear she is combining two positions she's not leaving her directorship of the land use department she will continue being that director and then she'll she's also bringing that higher level uh, director role to the operations function of the town so Keep going. So, Keep going. So, I, so I understand that, but if, and this is going back to last year a little bit, I think that um, it wasn't that there was a need around the assistant town manager, but that it was late in the budget process and it really wasn't as defined maybe as all of us would have liked. And so, you know, if there's a need for that going forward, should we be thinking about this kind of higher level position? And then if we're doing that, how do we set that person up for success, right? And, and splitting them between the responsibilities that they had, <coughs> moving them into new responsibilities is not always the right formula. So I just want to make sure we're really thoughtful about, about what we're doing with somebody that's got a lot of town experience, that has relevant education, um, and has had a senior role for a long time against what the needs of the town manager's office are going forward. Keep going. Yeah. A couple of things. Clearly, again, she will not be coming in to do administrative work. We, we have a, a specific role in the office that will be taking care of that. Um, in terms of the longer picture view, I think that's why I said um, we're doing this because there's an opportunity and also because we want to pursue some of the strategic long-term goals that we have had for the office in terms of our needs. And so what, then this, what this, this proposal does, it gives us an opportunity to actually test run the concept of an assistant town manager, to put it bluntly. Yeah. So just keep going yeah keep going Mr. Kamal. so i think i don't think we test run this we if this is the way to go then you got to commit to it yep. that that's what i think so i'm not knocking the idea like i said that i think there's a lot of good stuff in here um but i think the position <coughs> needs to be a little more clearly defined maybe than trying to trying to ease in it let's what is it exactly that we need and how can this person fulfill that clearly right and and not kind of diluting her skill set across multiple obligations that's what I'd like to see around this. Okay. Just again, finally, um, if if you if you look across towns, it's not unusual for the assistant town manager position to have responsibility for another large department. It could be land use, it mm -hmm. could be finance, it could be HR. Mm -hmm. So this this thought process does not necessarily dilute the position. But it also, what it does is it, it, it actually, uh, I think, strengthens the organization. It's also f fiscally responsible. Uh, but in the long term, it, it provides, uh, I think, a, 
uh, a professional growth and development uh, path um, for a, an employee who's, who's in us. The idea is you're broadening or not putting it under administrative tasks. Yeah. 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 So that's a fair point. I'm not, I'm not familiar with how things are done all across towns. I know sometimes they're done differently, public versus, versus private. I just, I just want to make sure the role is defined. It's, it's a role that's appropriate for her experience and skill set and, and that it, it does um, extract from administrative so that there is the ability to be strategic and, and it is clearly defined. She has the resources to be successful. Mrs. Historian. Yeah, I think, um, I think that this proposal has uh, a few merits. Um, you know, first of all, I think that uh, we need to keep Elaine growing and challenged. Um, she's, she's clearly shown that uh, she's, uh, she has strong contributions for the town. We need to make sure that we're keeping her engaged. Um, the other thing is I think that the town manager's office and the town manager himself uh, can benefit from having her type of experience and, and her level of experience uh, aid him in his day-to-day -day and, and also in his strategic efforts for us. I think the other thing that this is good, uh, the other reason this is good is right now over uh, on the planning board and the board of selectmen and take the town manager's office and land use and planning, it's really these silos. And I think that having some link between the two is, is a benefit to the town. Uh, and it helps us be, you know, that, that one town that we want to be. And, and it also helps us coordinate our efforts uh, between the planning board and the board of selectmen. One thing that I'd like to see, and, and I don't know if the answer is available tonight, but one thing I would like to see is, so we've got, from a budget standpoint, and I guess, uh, um, you know, an HR standpoint, we've got over in land use and planning, we've got Elaine's position, and then, I'm sorry, uh, who's, who's taking on some of her responsibilities? Jennifer Burke, the principal Jennifer. planner. Jennifer, so we've got, we've got Jennifer and Elaine, and then over on the town manager's uh, tree, we have Jamie's old position. So I understand that uh, Elaine will continue to be director of land use and planning and be drawing, uh, you know, for what it's worth, you know, some of her salary from, from that pocket of the town. And then we're also going to uh, supplement her salary um, essentially from, from Jamie's salary pool that's available. So then there's still some of Jamie's salary pool that's available. There's also some of his responsibilities that, you know, we're probably not going to have Elaine uh, um, be responsible for directly. So I'm wondering what, what the plan is with that. Is the plan to uh, try to try to grow that small pool into something where we bring someone in of Jamie's caliber again? Or is the plan to just use what's left there to bring someone in who... Uh, you know, it was probably a little bit lower level than Jamie was, and I'm, I'm just curious what the plan is there. Um, there are two schools of thought regarding that, um, that, that question. One, there may be a need uh, to uh, at least strengthen our administrative pool. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an idea to um, have a roving administrative support person, specifically having them work with the town manager's office, the HR office, and the town clerk. That's, that's one school of thought. Uh, the other school of thought is uh, how those funds could be used to strengthen the land use department. Um, we, we have an individual in the land use department who um, is excellent financial skills uh, who can actually uh, grow into uh, processing all the accounts receivables for the town. Uh, we may actually bring that, that, that position into this discussion as well. Yeah. But the first preference would be to get an administrative roving individual who will support at least the town manager's office, HR, as well as town clerk. And would that require an expansion of, of you know, outside of regular annual type, um, type expansions that can require an expansion of that from the inside of the pool? I don't believe so. 
Mr. Catino. Okay. Um, not taking anything away from what everybody else asked. I think those are, those are wonderful questions. Um, but in, uh, trying to look more on the positive side, I've been working with Elaine on a weekly basis for many years now. And I think that that, that giving her some of the tools from the town manager's um, department will really um, uh, make her shine. I think it's, uh, this is, it's uh, the, you know, looking at the strategic focus with growth issues in town, that's something that, that came up with the uh, cross point and, and all of that, that people were saying, geez, isn't there anybody looking out and marketing the town? You know, if some brand rec get somebody out there that's going to help us with brand recognition. Um, and I think that, that um, the uh, integration uh, of economic de development and land use is going to be a real boom for the town. So not uh, all those other things are very important, and I think we have to look into them. But um, this is uh, just something I think she's going to be just fabulous for the, for the town. Okay. Mr. Harr. Uh, in general, I like the concept and want to explore it further with, with everybody. Uh, I'm concerned that we're talking about personalities more than we're talking about organizational behavior and structure. Uh, we're running a business here. And with all due respect to all the individuals, us included, it should run regardless of personality. And a lot of the discussion is about personality and individuals. And I think we have to focus uh, our organizational plan and structure based on the needs of the organization and the growth and the process to go forward. So I would just encourage us to keep it at that level uh, as we go through more discovery to figure out what makes the best sense, what makes the best sense for the community. Uh, second, and I, I think uh, my colleagues were touched on a little bit, but it, just to be clear in my head and for those that are interested in at home, when we went to town meeting in May, there was a request before town meeting to add a position <coughs> called the assistant town manager, correct? That is correct. And was that position going to be an increase in headcount? Yes. And this plan, regardless of the personalities, this structure you're describing, would this increase headcount? No. So this would keep headcount flat, or would it be down one? Down one. So we'd go down one in headcount, and our cost structure would either remain the same or actually decrease slightly. I would like it to remain the same. Okay. How about the administrative support to come in to support this position, that roving position, whatever, is that an increase, would that be an increase in headcount? I mean, what's the long-term plan to support this new creation? Is that going to increase headcount? It will not. Okay. So the only concern I have outside the personality discussion, uh, which I'm sure we can get past quite quickly, is are we violating the will of town meeting by trying to do this, or not trying, implementing something along these lines. Um, and I don't remember all the details of the debate around that question before town meeting, but I'm assuming a fair bit of it was increase in headcount and increase in cost. So if, it, if that was the debate at town meeting, and that was the concern, and that's why it failed, then we're not violating the will of town meeting by not increasing headcount and not increasing cost. And then I'm more comfortable moving forward with an organizational structure discussion, and then we'll slot in personalities after we figure out the structure. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, in my understanding, the request before town meeting was whether we could appropriate funding for the position. I don't believe um, that the charter or the town bylaws require town meeting approval of the organizational structure. Fair enough, but there's politics in town and there's perception in town and we have to manage to that perception whether we like it or not. And as long as we recognize and respect what town meeting said, but still recognize that we have to manage the business on a day-to-day, week-to-week, and month-to-month basis in between town meetings, and we're not violating the, uh, the message that town meeting put forward by saying no, I'm comfortable with it. 
but I just want to be very clear and articulate those ideas and those thoughts and those concerns so that if anybody else shares them, that they can voice them now before we go too far down this path. We're not voting on this tonight, I assume. So There's nothing to vote. There's, no vote. I'm he, sorry? there's nothing to vote. He runs the store. So he could go ahead and do this unilaterally? He can do it. He's just, he's just like, I mean, again, this falls in the category of things that are unambiguously in his control. He's just, unless he needs more money for it, which he doesn't, he can, he can do this tomorrow. He, all, he could have already done this. All the more reason why we should, you know, support where we can these types of initiatives. So I'm, I'm very interested. I like this idea. I think it's a growth opportunity for our, our structure, our structure. Uh, it's not a burden on the taxpayers that I can see, uh, and any, an additional burden. It's not a future additional burden by increasing headcount. Um, so I, I'm wide open to it. Uh, the title, I think, is something that we need to be sensitive to because town meeting said no assistant town manager. So let's be re- respect that and understand not that we're trying to do an end around, but that we want to do this in a way that's respectful of that decision at that time. Can you do that? Yes. Uh, I think I think as, as you said earlier, there's work to be done. On a day-to-day basis, we have to manage the organization, making sure that the work gets done uh, on behalf of the citizens of this town. Okay. Mr. Mosier. So, so to be fair on the town manager thing, there was last, – last year was last year, and you bring up some good points, Mr. Herr, but I, there, there wasn't – a real structure around that proposal, and I think that this is this is a good time for Norman to be able to put that structure around this and you know package <coughs> it up. I just I'm just not entirely sure how you do it without headcount either. Um, I mean, are things slow in the land use department? Are we going to have one administrator and then this position in in the in the town manager's office? Um, and, and then I just go back to the point I made earlier. I just want to make sure this position is able to succeed. Um, but I think we've, I've said enough and kind of talked about it enough, so I'm good. Okay. From my perspective, I think this has been a really good conversation. I mean, I, I, like the high, I like the high level comments. I think the structure stuff is spot on. You're exactly, I think, in fact, you two were saying the same thing. I do think, Ms., so Ms. Kamal, I mean, again, this unambiguously falls in your purview. You don't have to come to the board to move people's positions around um, as long as you're obviously filling whatever contractual obligations you have and not looking for more money. I will say that um, I agree with all this about the structure part, though. I do think we need to tighten up maybe the, the title a little more and the job. So strategically, it makes a ton of sense to me. Let me start with that, right? Everything Mr. Catino said, I completely agree with. Like, land use and planning is paramount in this community, and so... And, and so having a person who can, who's been doing that for a long time but who also can start to take a broader view of it, I mean, if I recall correctly, you came up through the planning side of things, right? So I think, I think having someone who can grow into that role is fabulous. We, I, would, I think the recommendation, the suggestion from the board, and that's all I think all we can do really, is, is this may need a little more tightening of the job description. We probably don't want to use the word operations assistant to the town manager because I think it, car- I think it carries connotations, at least with some of us, of a more administrative role. Um, um, I think we should think a little bit more about how we want to delineate the town manager's responsibilities because this obviously could, could take care of some of that and free you up for some things. So, again, I, I think f- what the reason I think you need to do that is, is so you can explain to the board who does what, and so we can also understand what your role is, which I think will grow in a different direction as well, and so we can start to think about that for you. So I think this has been a very good discussion, and, um, and I, don't think, I think the board's generally supportive is what I heard, and, but, um, but I think we do think it just needs to be a little, bit more, a little bit more clarification, a little bit more thought about the title. I agree with everything about the assistant town manager. People that aren't – and. I think people aren't inherently against this as a town manager. I think we just didn't do a very good job of presenting the rationale or any of the attributes of it, you know, why it really mattered last year, the compelling points. So I'm, le- I'm less bothered by the title, but um, uh, uh, we can figure that out later. Anybody else want to talk about this at all? We don't need to get, do anything for you. You're just, you're just reporting to us. Okay. Great. Next. Fiscal year 17 budget update. Yes, um, I just wanted to give the board a heads up that uh, we were gearing up to presenting the budget at the board's next meeting, March 1st. 
Um, before then, I will be contacting you individually just to walk you through uh, the numbers as we see them. Okay. Yeah. March 1st, did you say? Yeah, we have three meetings in March. It's next March, week. 1 8 15, every three, every, the first three weeks in March. I will just comment, Ms. Kamala, we are behind, and I know why we're behind, and I'm not upset that we're behind, just sort of the way it happened with the downstairs this year, but we've got, we got a lot to do <laughs> in not a lot of time. Um, Where's is Chris here? Where's Chris? No, he's not here. We got, we got, we got a lot to do, right? And, yeah. and so the budget's making me very anxious right now. Anybody else have any anxieties they want to relate? Just a quick question: Are we are we getting together with our friends in the school committee to coordinate through the superintendent's office various discussions? Yeah, we were talking with uh, both uh, uh, the superintendent as well as uh, as Ralph. Uh, okay. We have committed to making sure that uh, we keep them in the loop as the process unfolds. Do you sense any disconnects between those two offices at this time? At this point, I'm, I'm not sensing any. I, I think our first meeting was very productive. I, I'm always impressed uh, by what I hear from Kathy. Uh, her, her vision for, for the school department is, I think, is impressive. Um, and as we've proven over the last years, uh, we will always try and find a way to, to support uh, her goals and her team's goals. Are these meetings in the same space with everyone sitting around a table looking at each other? Yeah, we they have a better conference room, so we are, are last meeting as uh, It's that. fine. Okay. Thank you. Anything else in time manager's report, Ms. Mr. Kamala? At this point, I believe I'm... Uh, You're done. I'm all set. Okay. Future board agenda items. Mr. Katina. Uh, again, I think we should start looking at parking downtown. Parking. Wow. Okay. Mr. Hearn. No, we have say on that? Yeah, on that issue, I think our goal is to come before the board either March 1st or the following meeting to present uh, a progress report on the Main Street Corridor project. Okay. So repeat that for me, please. Um, Mr. Cortino, I uh, had indicated a desire to hear more about parking in the downtown. I pointed out that uh, staff is planning to come before the board in the next, either the March 1st or the following meeting. Uh, to present an update or the progress report on the Main Street Corridor project. Including the intersection? Yes. Okay. It's gotten a lot more interesting. Uh, and you said you were going to agenda items. Mr. Mosher? Um, <coughs> two things. I got an email from somebody, I don't know, maybe a month ago or so about GE moving to the Boston area. Oh, and I wonder yeah. if this might be a good time to uh, crank up 2020 again. Let's see about... Um, if we had somebody in strategic economic development, <laughs> if we had somebody in strategic economic development, right, right. Um, so that was one, and then the other one was uh, around parking, also in the um, in the intersection um, around Glow's property there. Yeah, we need to spend some time on that, Mr. Kamal. We got to find some time to work this yeah. that I mean, in a meaningful way. <clears throat> we should really think seriously about what we can get done this spring on that. Okay. I can assure the board. We will be very busy on that project. Yeah. Um, okay. When when we met last week with Eversource <coughs> and Mass DOT, mm -hmm. um, I think we actually defined uh, some of the issues that we all need to be working on, and it's pretty substantial work okay. on, on on Dave's part. Okay. Yeah. So let's make let's get that in the agenda the next couple of weeks if we can. Yeah. You know, probably maybe more than once. Okay. Uh, that's it for agenda items. Chair, will entertain a motion to adjourn? So, so second. second. Motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Present. Good night, everyone.